So today we will be discussing eight questions and uh, I invite Dr. Sai Dishit to start the session. Over to Dr. Sai Dishit. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Today's my questions are uh, importance of temperature in anesthesia and uh, post-operative recovery scoring, sir. Okay. First, I'll start with the uh, importance of temperature in anesthesia, sir. Okay. Anesthesiologist is entrusted with many important responsibilities during perioperatively peri experience uh, behind anesthetizing the patient, including many things. Among them is maintaining normothermia, sir. Inadvertent uh, hypothermia is one of the most common complications during perioperative period where core body temperature is less than 36 degrees centigrade, sir. Normal temperature of the body is uh, uh, body and thorax is core body temperature, sir, which is normal at 37 degrees centigrade, sir, which is uh, where peripherally 2 to 4 degrees less than core, sir. Uh, physiology, sir. Uh, in an in anesthetized patient, regardless of environment, the core temperature maintained in a narrow range where it is a life-saving adaptation for various physiological systems which function optimally. Uh, this is called uh, thermoregulation, sir, which is at achieved by integration of three steps. Uh, front uh, thermal sensing, central regulation, and uh, front response, sir. Uh, uh, these uh, receptors are present in hypothalamus, other parts of the brain, spinal cord, uh, deep thoracic, abdomen, and skin surface, sir. Uh, the cold uh, uh, cold sensation which is carried by hair delta fibers and warm sensation is carried by C, unmyelinated C fibers. Through uh, spinothalamic tract of the anterior spinal cord and uh, trigeminal nerve from the face, sir. Uh, where uh, central regulation, uh, these uh, nerves are integrated and uh, reg central regulation occurs at the hypothalamus, sir. Where efferent uh, response is uh, carried out by posterior hypothalamus, where, a, where maintains a normal temperature set point between 36.7 to 37.1 degrees centigrade. Uh, it is called interthreshold temperature, sir. Outside this interthreshold temperature, uh, uh, efferent uh, response will occur, sir. Threshold temperature is that which effer, uh, effect is activated, and gain is the rate of response to change in temperature. Normal uh, behavioral responses are moving away from the cold and uh, uh, resting appropriately, voluntary movement, uh, positioning, altering ambient temperature, sir. And the autonomic regulation for cold is uh, cutaneous vasoconstriction, non shearing uh, thermogenesis, uh, which occurs uh, in uh, skeletal muscle and brown fat, controlled by not epinephrine cell, and shearing uh, uh, thermogenesis, uh, which is last response to the cold. For uh, heat response, the uh, first is vasodilation, which is mediated by uh, nitrous oxide, and uh, uh, sweating, which is mediated by post ganglionic cholinergic nerves, sir. Which, uh, this is the physiology, sir. And uh, pathophysiology is in uh, uh, an in anesthetized patient markedly impair this uh, thermoregulatory control, so more prone to hypothermia, particularly in unwarmed patient and cold OT rooms, and where behavioral adaptive response is not possible. Uh, in uh, general anesthesia, the hypothermia has a char uh, characteristic triphasic response, sir. Uh, initial decrease, initial de rapid decrease, uh, linear reduction, and plateau phase, sir. In initial rapid decrease, agents induce vasodilation occurs where heat flows through uh, towards periphery, and uh, there will be decrease of 0 to 0 0.5 to 1.5 degrees centigrade in first mm -hmm. hour where further uh, step is followed by uh, linear reduction phase in uh, it, it occurs in next two to three hours where heat loss is more than heat production uh, further decreases in one to two degrees centigrade 
uh, in this phase, various modes of heat loss is like radiation, convection, evaporation, and conduction, sir. Radiation is around uh, 50 to 70 percent, which mostly depends on ambient temperature. And uh, in, con uh, in convection mode, uh, in convection mode, uh, where uh, heat loss is uh, depend on the velocity of the air uh, flow through uh, uh, flow on the body of the patient and uh, next to by evaporation where uh, where heat loss is through fluids uh, skin and uh, respiration bowel and uh, wounds sir. and next phase is a uh, plateau phase which occurs in next three two hours where heat loss is equal to heat production and the air there uh, stabilizes the body of temperature, sir. Induraxial anesthesia alters uh, physiological thermal aggregation, both in both epidural and the spinal, uh, decreases the threshold of 0 0.6 degrees centigrade. And uh, more it, uh, heat loss is, it depends on the number of spinal segment blockers, sir. Uh, it's supplemented with uh, sedatives and uh, narcotics further impairs uh, this uh, thermoregulatory control, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, risk factors for uh, hypothermia is is more than uh, 60. Uh, uh, neonates, infants, and children where body surface area is more than body mass and uh, who are having poor subcutaneous fat and uh, poor vasomotor control, sir. And low body weight, poor nu nutritional status, and the pre-existing uh, conditions like uh, diabetes, uh, polyneuropathy, uh, hypothyroidism, sedatives, burns, and the massive trauma, sir. The actually recommended ambient temperature of the OT in adult, for adults is uh, uh, 21 degrees centigrade and the children is uh, 24 degrees centigrade, sir. Uh, causes for hypothermia, sir. Uh, which increase heat loss due to cold exposure, uh, cold infusions, induced vasodilatations, and uh, having a burns. With uh, the causes for uh, decreased heat production is uh, is hypoglycemia, malnutrition, endocrine failure like hypopituitarism, hypoadrenalism, hypothyroidism, and DKS, uh, and impaired thermoregulation, which causes hypothermia uh, or uh, neuropathies, diabetes. A CVA central or neurological failure, sir. Changes which occurs with hypothermia are, are decreases oxygen delivery uh, from system to system, sir. First, oxygen delivery, uh, FPO2 curve shifted to left, uh, that is uh, release more oxygen to the tissues, so increase in systemic vascular resistance and uh, increase in peripheral uh, hypoperfusion, sir. Acid base balance uh, uh, which occurs. Metabolic acidosis, sir, and uh, hematologically it increases viscosity, increases uh, platelet uh, count, uh, in the PT uh, decreases platelet aggregation, and uh, decreases fibrinogen activity, which impair coagulation and platelet function, sir. In uh, CVS, uh, vasoconstriction occurs, sir, which increases systemic vascular resistance, decreases heart rate, decreases uh, contractility, which causes decreases cardiac output, sir. Uh, Further decrease in temperature leads to ventral fibrillations and uh, asystole, sir. In, in, pulmonary, uh, in uh, the spirit system, increase uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, decrease uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which leads to uh, increase V by Q mismatch, sir, and decreases ventilatory drive. Uh, in uh, hepatic system, uh, decreases function of the liver, which causes decreases in drug metabolism. Uh, Glucose and uh, citrate where not metabolized leads to hyperglycemia, sir. Uh, in renal system, decreases uh, renal blood flow, which, which leads to decreases uh, excretion of drugs, sir. In CNS, decreases uh, cerebral blood flow uh, uh, and increases evapotential latencies, which leads to decreases max, sir. Mm. Uh, this is inadvertent hypothermia, which had to be recognized to main, uh, contribute to uh, many myocardial outcomes like myocardial ischemia and uh, surgical site uh, infections and uh, increases blood loss due to hypothermia induced platelet dysfunction and uh, coagulation cascade enzyme dysfunction, sir. And uh, increased duration of post operative anesthetic recovery due to prolonged anesthetic drug action and the patient discomfort, sir. Mm. Uh, 
prevention and uh, management sir assessment uh, core temperature uh, uh, represent the temperature at the thoracic abdomen and the C cns temperature which is tightly and tightly controlled uh, measured at sites at uh, distal esophagus nasopharynx pulmonary artery sir uh, pulmonary artery is the gold standard uh, site for the um, measuring the uh, temperature in the body sir uh, near core temperature is measured at axillary rectal bladder and uh, oral sir easier to obtain but uh, affected by external influences sir Commonest uh, site in adults uh, preoperatively to measure temperature oral and intraoperatively at the use of Vegas, sir. Interventions uh, have to pre warming the uh, OT prior to shifting the patient and uh, a thermal passively by thermal insulators and blankets and active warming during surgery by forced airing, air warmings, uh, circulating water garments, restrict to heating, sir resist to eating and the warming uh, infusions and uh, blood products warming uh, irrigating solutions ambient uh, temperature con control uh, airway heating and uh, humidification sir mm, hyperthermia uh, which is also more uh, more danger than the hypothermia uh, causes discomfort and increase in metabolic demand and uh, cardiovascular stress. Uh, where uh, in the, uh, core temperature exceeds normal values. Mm, past hypothermia results from the excessive patient eating without adequate core temperature monitoring. Uh, fever uh, which develop when, uh, develops when set point of the thermoregulatory system increases. Uh, in, in general anesthesia, volt anesthetic and opiate inhibit the expression of uh, fever. So there are different uh, uh, differential diagnoses for uh, fever intraoperatively or uh, thyroid storm, fever chromocytoma, sepsis, light anesthesia, uh, drug reaction, uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, uh, serotonin syndrome. Uh, sir. Uh, oral uh, treatment of is uh, supportive treatment, discontinue prescribing drug, maintain cardiorespiratory stability, control airway, sir, and uh, cooling techniques uh, like uh, uh, gastric larvae, folis irrigation, ice packs, ice uh, IVF, hypothermia blanket, cold irrigation, sir. Uh, maintain u volumic state and uh, anticipate DIC, rhabdomyolysis, renal, and uh, hepatic failure. Diagnosis and treatment, treating and infections. That's it, sir. Okay. Okay. That's a very nice presentation, Sai. And a uh, well, few points which I think I can add is uh, the first and foremost thing whenever a question on temperature regulation is asked, what do you have to say is. There is a difference in the behavior of or the change in the temperature pattern of the patient who is undergoing general anesthesia from the patient who is undergoing surgery and the regional anesthesia. Whenever you make the patient unconscious by administering general anesthesia to the patient, you have to use this terminology what is called patients or persons who are conscious they may try to maintain the body temperature at the same level irrespective of the ambient or outside temperature. So they are called homeothermic individuals. Their body temperature will remain at the same 38 degrees centigrade, whether you are in Himalayas or in Brahmagandam or Bhadrajalam where the temperature is very high outside. Okay. okay sir. Once the patient loses consciousness, he becomes what is called poikilothermic individual. That is, he tries to take up the ambient temperature to his body. And he is not able to maintain the same 38 degrees when the consciousness is lost by induced anesthesia. And it is common for even other people who become comatose also. Because, as you said, the, the, the most uh, regulatory center at the hypothalamus this uh, becomes different at this particular level when the consciousness is lost because it receives inputs from various sources. As you said, there are three things apparent, center, and different to maintain the body temperature. And body temperature 
is maintained more accurately than your heart rate and your blood pressure because of the interconnections. And uh, this point has to be first emphasized. And you have beautifully described the physiology, but you must mention also the receptors which are responsible for uh, sensing the warmth and cold. They are called TRPV and TRPM receptors. Okay? Okay. And uh, all the other points are, and you have nicely uh, divided it into hypothermia and hyperthermia. So we come across more commonly hypothermia generally because of the <clears throat> low ambient temperature of the OOT as well as the patient getting exposed, being uh, not able to cover him all the time. So they are more likely to become hypothermic. And the fall in temperature usually happens during the first 30 minutes rapidly and then becomes a plateau and stabilizes. And depending upon the exposure of the body, or the exposure of the internal organs to the ambient temperature, then it gradually goes down. <laughs> Beyond yes, the particular yes. level, it, it will not go down. So that will be, uh, so that time period is very important. So during the initial phase, you have to keep the patient nicely covered and uh, use all the warming techniques so that he doesn't rapidly lose the temperature and become hypothermic. And the common uh, side effects or complications of the patient becoming hypothermic are, as you rightly said, coagulation difficulty, delayed drug elimination, delayed recovery, uh, prolonged uh, neuromuscular blockade. And uh, once they recover, <coughs> the body tries to bring back the temperature. Apart from our measures to warm the patient, they start shivering and to get back to the normal temperature. That is a very deleterious thing for especially people who are elderly or people who have already some compromised cardiac function like ischemic heart disease. In fact, uh, it increases the oxygen demand almost 400 to 800%. <clears throat> so even if the oxygen supplementation is given, we can uh, sometimes they can land up with a myocardial acute myocardial infarction or ischemia. So the prevention is very much important. and. Uh, you have nicely described. Did you mention malignant hyperthermia and the hyperthermia conditions? Yes, sir. Okay, right. <clears throat> so, uh, hyperthermia, uh, especially any preoperative sepsis, can stimulate hyperthermia intraoperatively. So, that is the reason why we always investigate and find out that uh, uh, any source of sepsis is not there before we give anesthesia. And uh, in a patient who is undergoing uh, surgery under neuroxial blockade, especially spinal or epidural, they are na naturally, they try to uh, shiver. Even if there is uh, no but the body temperature being normal, sometimes they start uh, developing a trigger or shivering. And uh, with the, if the temperature becomes low and then they start uh, shivering, it is a compensatory phenomenon. On the contrary, some patients may have a normal temperature and start shivering. That indicates the onset of an infection. So we have to be very careful in identifying and trying to treat that. So the treatment will be totally different. If it is infection or sepsis, you have to go for antibiotic and other supportive measures. Whereas if it is a mere hypothermia caused by vasodilatation and heat loss, the treatment is totally different. And uh, you can mention a few things about the prevention of this uh, hypothermia and shivering in after spinal. Drugs which can be used to counteract this, like uh, your tramadol, your pethidine, your uh, even ketamine, all these things are uh, drugs which can be given preemptively before administering spinal or epidural to prevent the shivering that is likely to happen. Okay. So if you add these points, I think that it will be <coughs> a complete answer. And you are nicely prepared, uh, but you have to, sir. Hmm, yeah. I said, no, so it was a very good presentation, no problem at all. But just I thought to make it look uh, more neat as a presentation. Uh, yeah, you have to uh, modify it and you uh, uh, could say, some headings uh, and then. You could say how temperature affects anesthesia and then say how anesthesia affects temperature, effect yes. of hypothermia on the anesthesia, like that. You can make it into, the presentation can be more uh, clear, sir. 
So Correct. Yeah. Which was, that should uh, be uh, uh, little even messed, and uh, little good shape uh, to present uh, as yes, a nice yeah. uh, That's one thing. I he could also say something about uh, uh, hypothermia following uh, cardiac arrests uh, and, um, and deliberate hypothermia in certain individuals. Uh, when do we use deliberate hypothermia, like cardiac surgery and all that? So, other one day, I, so I think it will be worthwhile to mention that. Rather yeah, than yeah. time, of course, initially it was good, but then somewhere he mentioned nitrous oxide. I don't know why he mentioned nitrous oxide. I think that's wrong. Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide so. Yeah, yeah, nitric oxide. So, uh, so you can't make uh, like in the what happens is when we sit as examiners, uh, the first thing that comes to that strikes us is something which goes wrong. So, you know, that that will be picked up very easily by the examiner. So just make sure that you don't make any mistakes. And um, and I think the presentation can be a little more, uh, uh, a more little more clarity can be there in the presentation. Give slide okay. and write it more clearly. Thank you, like, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Can I add two points, madam? Can I add yes, two points, sir? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Sai, you are from a cardiac center. So never forget that that a patient's temperature should be above 32 degrees during resuscitation and defibrillation. If you defibrillate below 32, anyway, it's going to again going to fibrillate. Yeah, that's one thing. And post uh, post uh, uh, defibrillation, what happens to the temperature? That's another thing which we have to keep in mind. Okay, and uh, another thing is when you are presenting like this and you are uh, prepared the answer for the benefit of other students who are participating in the program, you can just put up your uh, PDF in the group so that we can circulate to all the students. And we can get the feedback from other students also. We can learn from others. Thank you. That's can a we good suggestion. The... Whatever uh, you are preparing, put it in a Word document or a PDF format and uh, circulate it uh, through email or WhatsApp to your uh, colleagues so that uh, uh, they can also contribute or make uh, corrections and then try to improve on the answer, which will be a perfect one when you write the, so that everybody will, because you are just uh, saying it in audio form, uh, how much it will be retained is a little uh, question mark. So you have to, if you, if you have it in a, a PDF or a Word document format, People can refer to it anytime before exam and it will be useful. They will not forget uh, what has been taught. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I request all the students to uh, please put up your uh, hard work in either PDF form or um, words, uh, word format so that other students can keep record of it and understand use it during their exams. So can we move on to the next question, sir? Yeah. I have got a PPT, but I will show it at the end uh, as a some. Uh, including uh, this thing. I yes, have, sir. I have prepared PPTs for all the eight questions. Yes, sir. But I don't want to interrupt now and uh, this time, so we will have it as a final uh, sum up uh, session. Okay, sir. Okay. You can go to the next topic, sir. Okay. Dr. Sai, you can proceed with the next topic. My next question is a post-operative recovery scoring, sir. Mm. Uh, Patient uh, is moved through the unit and discharged when they achieve a set, a set of criteria using a scoring system. Mm. Uh, there are stages of recovery, sir. In first stage of recovery, uh, which is uh, occurs in uh, PACU, which is uh, early recovery, and uh, second stage of recovery, which is called uh, intermediate recovery, and third stage of recovery is, uh, is uh, where we can discharge, and the fourth stage of recovery where uh, post discharge follow up will be there, sir. Uh, all the data is scoring system which uh, devised in 1970 commonly used scale for determining when people can safely discharge from the PACU to either the post surgical ward or to second stage recovery area further it is modified into modified uh, all the data scoring 1995 uh, they are having five, five sets of criteria uh, five sets of parameters to uh, define whether patient can be uh, discharged or not, sir. Uh, in that uh, modified uh, already scoring, uh, first one is oxygenation, where uh, SpO2 is more than 92% in room air, uh, sets a point to value to, and uh, SpO2 is more than 90 in room air uh, score one, SpO2 less than 90% in room air, uh, it scores zero, sir. Further uh, parameter is respiration, where patient breathe deeply and calm.
off freely having score 2 where uh, patient is uh, dysnic having shallow limited breathing score 1 uh, for score 0 patient is in apneic sir and uh, for circulation uh, bp pressure minus uh, 20 mm of hg of normal original bp uh, score 2 and where bp pressure minus 20 to 50 mm of hg of normal bp score 1 and uh, more than plus or minus 50 mm, mm of hg normal uh, of normal bp score 0 uh, further is consciousness where uh, patient is fully awake score 2 where patient is ar arousable on calling it is score 1 and uh, where patient is not response on calling uh, uh, score 0 sir. and uh, activity uh, where pa and command uh, where patient moves all extremities score 2 and uh, where patient moves only two extremities score 1 and uh, no movements uh, score 0 sir. Zero. If, if patient uh, uh, scores more than 8 uh, eight out of 10 we can uh, shift the patient to PACU room sir. PACU to what? PACU to what sir. Yes, sir. That's it. That's it. Yeah, the question is post operative recovery score. First, uh, the post operative recovery score, as you said, that the average score is the most commonly followed. It was originally described in 1970 uh, in order to decide whether the patient is fit enough to be shifted from the post anesthetic care unit to the common general ward where monitoring and and uh, the attention to the patient will be much less compared to the PACU and the number of patients also will be more. They will all be on their own and independent. So the intense monitoring is not required. So in order to decide the safety of the patients to be shifted to a general ward or a common ward without much of uh, intense monitoring, Aldri described these five parameters which he decided as uh, <coughs> Uh, hallmark or standard for deciding whether the patient can be shifted from PACU. And he gave the scoring from 0, 1, 2, and the maximum score a person can get is 10 out of 10. Of the five parameters, if you get a score of 2 each, you will get a maximum of 10. But normally, 8 to 9 or 8 to 10 is considered as ideal and safe for the patient to be shifted out of that, which he himself modified it in 95. But uh, this same scoring system is nowadays used for the uh, criteria as a discharge for daycare patients, where the patients are sent back home itself. Okay, so the same post recovery score of Valdrit is used as a part of the deciding scoring system to decide not only to shift the patient from PAC to a general ward inside the hospital from the post anesthetic unit directly to the home also as practiced in the daycare surgery procedures nowadays. So they added three more things by two other people who added two more things to these five parameters which we are now taking into consideration. One is the pain, how much of pain is there in the patient. Second is whether the patient has got any post-operative nausea or vomiting or whether there is any residual effect of any neuromuscular blockade or uh, central neuroaxial blockade or local anesthetic blockade if we has been administered such anesthesia. So to the five parameters which are already there to monitor the vitals, these three also have been added and if the patient is not having much of pain and there is no nausea vomiting and there is no residual paralysis, along with these uh, five parameters, then the patient becomes fit enough to go home also. So the, this is now further modified for, to suit the daycare procedures which are commonly So if you add that also, I think the answer will be more complete. Any suggestions, Sajanti? Any more doubts from the students regarding these two questions? So nothing in the chat box also, sir. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Then thank you, sir. Presenter. Thank you. Yeah. Next presenter, Dr. Muthumani. Thank you, Dr. Sai Dikshit. We will now move on to Dr. Muthumani. Nice uh, preparation, Sai. Very good. You have done a good job. 
Good evening, sir. Yeah, Dr. Muthumani. Go to Dr. Muthumani. Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir. Good evening. Yeah. sir, my first question is effect of positioning during anesthesia, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, shall I start, sir? Yeah, please. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. The aim of optimal positioning for surgery is to provide best surgical access while minimizing potential risk to the patient. Each position carries some degree of risk and this is magnified by the anesthesia patients who cannot make others aware of compromised positions. Commonly adopted positions include supine position, prone position, lateral position, lithotomy position, Lloyd Davis position and seated position. Many of these positions are modified with the addition of a vertical tilt which is Trendelenburg and reverse Trendelenburg position. Effects of supine position during anesthesia. The lung volumes are impaired by the cephalid movement of abdominal viscera. This results in reduction in functional residual capacity, which is detrimental to gas exchange with increased ventilation perfusion mismatch and a decrease in pulmonary compliance. Redistribution of pooled venous blood from lower limb increases venous return to heart and subsequent increase in cardiac output. This may partially offset the cardiovascular depression effects of anesthesia techniques. Severe hypotension occur as a result of compression of in inferior vena cava against vertebral body. This typically affects obese or pregnancy patients. Central distribution of blood may lead to volume overload in the failing heart. The classical supine position leads to the loss of natural lumbar lordosis and this is associated with post-operative lower backache. And the occiput, sacrum and heel are the are, in, are associated with increased risk of developing pressure sores. Complications associated with supine positions. The most important complications are the airway obstruction and the impaired lung volumes, corneal raying and aberrations, and brachial plexus injury, primarily C8 and T1 roots. Prone position. This is also called concord position or face down position. An indication for prone position is spine surgeries, posterior cervical and occipital surgeries, thoracotomy by posterior approach and renal biopsies and percutaneous nephrolithotripsy and percutaneous nephrostomy. Effects of prone position during anesthesia. Care must be taken in keeping head safe in relation to the rest of the body. Body weight against abdominal wall leads to reduced diaphragmatic movement, reduced functional residual capacity and reduced tidal volume. Increased intra-abdominal pressure in prone position and pressure on inferior vena cava which results in decrease in venous return and which leads to hypotension. And this is compounded by sympathetic block associated with subarachnoid block and general anesthesia. And lesser airway pressure required to ventilate patient and this is because of weight and chest or weight of chest and abdominal wall does not have to be lifted. Complications of prone position. Neurological injuries like brachial plexus injury and facial nerve Ophthalmological injuries like corneal aberrations, anterior ischemic opt optic neuropathy and posterior ischemic optic neuropathy and accidental extubations due to loosening of adhesive tips due to sweat and saliva. Many of these complications associated with prone position can be avoided if adequate staff members are present to facilitate the maneuver at both beginning and end of the procedures. Third one, lithotomy position. It is the position in which the patient lying on his back with legs and thigh flexed to right angles. Types of lithotomy position. High lithotomy position, low lithotomy position, exaggerated lithotomy position and tilted lithotomy position. Indications for lithotomy position is perineal surgery, rectal surgery and vaginal surgeries and urological procedures. Effects of lithotomy position during anesthesia. It will increase the uh, in respiratory system, it will decrease the tidal volume by 3% and it will decrease the vital capacity by 18% and it will increase the uh, FEV1 by 9%. In CVS, in cardiovascular system, sudden elevation of lower limb leads to sudden increase in venous return to right heart which may precipitate congestive heart failure. And sudden lowering of lower limb can cause significant hypotension. Cephalid movement of ET tube occurs while uh, changing the patient position from supine to lithotomy. Unanticipated stimulation of carina with bronchospasm or endo endobronchial intubation may result. Complication of lithotomy positions. The most common complication is venous stasis or venous thromboembolism and damage to hip and knee, injury to head and hand and fingers when caudal portion of the table is lowered, compartment syndrome and peripheral nerve injuries like obturator nerve, femoral nerve, saphenous nerve and common peroneal nerve. The next one is lateral position. In lateral position, 
um, the dependent lung will be under ventilated and over perfused and the non dependent lung will be over ventilated and under perfused which which results in ventilation perfusion mismatch and hypoxemia in susceptible individuals and complications associated with the lateral position is greatly greatly in ocular ocular in both i and in both dependent and non dependent eyes risk of brachial plexus injury is there and neurological injuries like common peroneal nerve and saphenous nerve seated position is used only for specific procedures in seated position cv is affected primarily by venous pooling which leads to resistant hypotension and excessive head and neck head head sorry excessive neck flexion or extension can leads to obstruction of neck veins and most important complication in seated position is venous air embolism trendelenburg position in this position the diaphragmatic movement can be limited severely by the weight of the abdominal viscera it will further reduces functional residual capacity and causes atelectasis and complications of trendelenburg position is ventilation perfusion mismatch raised ice intracranial pressure and raised intraocular pressure and passive regurgitation in reverse trendelenburg position physiological effects are similar to seated position and beneficial physiological effects associated with reverse trendelenburg position are increase in venous drainage from head and neck reduction in intracranial pressure and reduced likelihood of passive regurgitation and complications associated with reverse trendelenburg position is hypotension and venous air embolism yes okay. so that's all okay very good so the <clears throat> first and foremost uh, point as you rightly mentioned is uh, change in the position of a patient from the supine position commonly adopted is mainly to facilitate the surgeon's uh, operative uh, convenience okay. we need a positioning only during intubation at all when we give ga we need proper positioning of the patient to achieve a successful intubation other than that uh, we don't require any other change maybe for giving a spinal we may need a lateral position or a sitting position which are all done in a patient when he is conscious so there is no issue about it or we don't require much of a help during that period whereas uh, the other positions which you describe and which are adopted for surgical exposure and uh, operative success requires a full team cooperation so that is the first point we have to note that positioning under anesthesia requires a uh, understanding helpful team and yes. uh, before going on to describe the various positions adapted you can uh, enumerate the complications that can be created by this alterations in the positions uh, so first one you have to give prudence there is uh, the airway <coughs> especially if it is being done under ga with uh, hidden endotracheal tube or uh, arterial mask airway we have to take care of the airway gadgets as well as patency of the airway comes uh, as a priority whenever you change the position second thing will be the hemodynamic or cardiovascular changes that happen third thing will be the respiratory parameters which will get altered depending upon the various positions fourth will be the nerve injuries due to stretching or abnormal position of the limbs and fifth will be the pressure point injuries which will happen so you can enumerate all the complications and uh, into this five headings airway hemodynamic respiratory nerve and pressure injuries so i or skin whatever it is happening so having said this introduction then you try to put a tabular column where you can <coughs> um on the first uh, column you can mention the position and the other two, uh, five parameters can be positioned i mean drawn into the five columns and you can say where airway will be jeopardized where there's a possibility of tube slipping out or migrating or lma getting dislodged or uh, second thing is what are all the hemodynamic changes where hypotension will be more severe in which condition hypotension hypertension can happen and uh, the uh, four, third is the respiratory parameters which get affected mainly the tidy volume the vagi capacity and the frc these are the three things which are commonly altered which can cause a problem in uh, like uh, venous admixture and hypoxemia and then fourthly the uh, 
nerve injuries and lastly the pressure points which have to be taken care of especially with a special reference to the eye uh, exposure or pressure injuries to the eye and uh, in this deep tunnel bulge i think you have to mention about the airway edema which is very common especially with the robotic surgery being very commonly performed nowadays they require a very steep uh, tunnel position up to almost uh, 70 to 80 degrees so the patient should not slip out of the table also that protection also has to be mentioned and uh, uh, lastly venous air embolism in sitting position that is uh, uh, hypotension and venous air embolism are two important uh, concerns when you are in sitting position for some your may especially neurosurgical procedures so if you modify your answers in this pattern i think that will be easier for you to write in the exam you will save a lot of time at the same time bring out all the points so and uh, complete your answer otherwise we have mentioned uh, most of the points well done yes sir yes sir yeah actually very good presentation sir actually exactly what i want is tabular column like you said you put the uh, uh, the position uh, the type of surgery why we do it cardiovascular respiratory nerve injuries tissue injuries things like that in addition to that probably what you could uh, really um, uh, introduce there is the uh, specific uh, uh, problems with specific uh, positioning for example a patient with a lithotomy uh, chances of compartment syndrome is high a patient with prone uh, chances of uh, eye uh, damage and uh, uh, post operative uh, transient blindness is more airway edema is more like that there are certain things which are specific to uh, specific position particular position yes can be highlighted yeah, that can be added at the last of yeah. miscellaneous and then you can any extra special remarks you can add there and in the lateral kidney bit position is also one of the commonly kidney yes sir yes a kidney uh, yeah that is a very important uh, thing where you can compress the ivc especially if the if you are going to put the patient on right side and then to raise the kidney pray Uh, sudden hypotension is a very common feature uh, once you raise the kidney bridge and uh, compression and the uh, nerve injuries and pressure point injuries and uh, even uh, vertebral injuries are very common because you are going to break the table and then uh, open up the distance between the rib cage and the pelvis so all those things can be mentioned as a special remark in lateral position <coughs> also well also uh, the arm mm. actually what we are basically concerned is what to do with the hands what to do with the legs you know things like that legs. so that can yeah. be such like more for practical uh, knowledge all right uh, yes correct how do you keep the neck whether you keep it neutral or you'll turn it to one side when you turn it to one side what happens to the tube the things like that so those things can be added it will be make uh, make it a full presentation excellent yes. actually brought in most of the points only thing um, certain things can be added like and sir like sir sir the tabular column will make it really very uh, impressive for the uh, exam thank you sir thank you madam uh, uh, one more point can i add madam yeah please uh, <laughs> you are also a teacher <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir okay uh, nowadays the pathophysiology and etiopathogenesis of these nerve injuries are uh, questioned in uh, court of law because of medical legal issues and they have come out with various theories whatever precautions we take not only the stretch or the thing some inflammatory events are happening during the surgery and some pre existing pathology is also there in the patient so pre operatively before accepting the patient in the history taking psc time it is mandatory to record the pre existing nerve injuries deficits or any other illness in the patient so that post operative claims can be avoided and similarly in the event of post operative you come across some uh, pathology now entrapments or any position related injuries it better to be with the patient and give them assurance reassurance follow it up never abandon them if you abandon them and fail to communicate effectively they get frustrated and unnecessary complications in the medical legal and other uh, angles can arise so proper documentation pre operatively in the during psc paper and intraoperative extra care taken for susceptible patients have to be documented in the nsc records and post operatively also document all the uh, normal findings also so that the patients can develop nerve injury symptoms even after one week 
So, so that I can add uh, one more about, point. Uh, so so whenever you plan to do uh, in position. Position, the regional technique in an uh, altered position other than supine, especially orthopedic, you know, when you do a hip fracture or hip replacement, we put the patient in the, under spinal or epidural in the lateral posture. So we should uh, be quite aware of uh, what is the duration of surgery, how long the surgeon will take, and how we are going to keep the patient in that uh, altered position for the entire duration of surgery without causing discomfort. Because elderly patients, after uh, say after one, one and a half hours, they will start complaining of shoulder pain. And they would like to go back to supine position and uh, that will be really uh, a stressful situation both for the, the patient as well as the anesthetist. So we should plan well in advance whether we are going to go Supplement GA also along with the regional technique like central neuroaxial if the surgery is going to take a long time. Similarly, they do nowadays uh, shoulder procedures under uh, 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 vertical plexus block. So, in the patient in the uh, sitting position or the recumbent beach chair position and all those things. Uh, unless the surgeon is quite fast and completes the surgery very quickly. It will be very inconvenient for the patient to remain awake for the entire duration of procedure. So that also you have to plan well in advance so that we don't make the patient uncomfortable and then uh, we cut a sorry figure in the middle of the surgery with the surgeon taking longer time and patient uh, going on nagging you as well as the surgeon. It will be a very sorry state of affairs. So we have to plan for that also. Right. Okay. Shall we go for the next uh, topic, Muthumani? Yes, yeah. sir. Can we move on to the next topic, Dr. Muthumani? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Sir, my second question is organ retrieval from cadaver, sir. Hmm. Definition of... Or do you accept with that uh, title? Uh, it's ah, actually sure. from brain, brain dead donor. Ah, we don't use the word cadaver actually. So, brain I just want to leave it like that so that I want to find... Yeah. Whether anybody organ finds donation. out whether we, we don't use that word cadaver donation at all now. So we yes, say as is a disease donor donation or a brain dead donor donation. Yes. Or there is a much more newer uh, terminology which is used. Anybody knows that? DNC is called DNC. Death using neurologic criteria. Okay? That is the latest terminology superseding brain death also. Mm. We'll go ahead. Yeah. Definition of death. Deceased person means a person in whom a permanent disappearance of all the evidence of life occurs by a reason of brainstem death. Second one in a cardiopulmonary sense. Brainstem death definition means that a stage at which all functions of brainstem have permanently and irreversibly ceased. And criteria for diagnosis is irreversible coma, absence of brainstem reflexes, and apnea. Absence of brainstem reflexes like irresponsive to noxious stimuli, absent pupillary light reflex, absent corneal reflex, absent oculocephalic and absent oculovestibular reflexes, and absent gag reflex and absent cock reflexes. Apnea test. The aim of this test is to check for the integrity of brainstem respiratory center at high levels of blood carbon dioxide. This test should be done by the patient should be observed for a definite period of time for clinical manifestations that are consistent with the diagnosis of brain death. Prerequisites for the apnea test. Proximate cause for unresponsive state that is incompatible with survival. Neurological imaging to confirm diagnosis like CT scan and MRI scan. Exclusion, exclusion of associated medical conditions that could account for unresponsiveness. And exclusion of drugs causing unresponsiveness. Drug overdoses. And core temperature should be greater than or equal to 36.5 degrees Celsius. u volumia or positive fluid balance in the previous 6 hours. Step for the apnea test. pre oxygenate patient with 100% O2 for 10 to 15 minutes to ensure denitrogenation of lungs. And to do a baseline ABG to achieve an arterial oxygen, oxygen level of greater than or equal to 200 millimeter of mercury for safely conducting the test. Connect a pulse oximeter, pulse oximetry and disconnect the ventilator. 4 to 6 liters per minute of O2 using a soft catheter via endotracheal tube into the trachea at the level of carina. Look closely for any respiratory movements. Measure arterial PO2 
PCO2 and PH after approximately 8 to 10 minutes later. For every minute of apnea, PACO2 rises approximately by 3 millimeter of mercury. If respiratory movements are observed, the apnea test is negative. That is, it does not support the clinical diagnosis of brain death. Terminate the test if patient systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100 millimeter of mercury and oxygen saturation not maintained during apnea testing and patient repeatedly desaturates or become hypotensive during apnea testing. Uh, criteria for patient selection, sir. Ideal donor should be less than 60 years, no end organ damage from systemic disease, proper intrinsic function of organ to be harvested, and requires cessation of both cerebral and brainstem function. And rule out diversible causes of coma like hypothermia, drugs, toxins, and hypotension. And contraindications for patient selections, absolute contraindications and relative contraindications. In absolute contraindications, it will be uncontrolled sepsis, active viral infections with like hepatite, hepatitis B and C virus, cytomegalovirus and HIV infections, and malignancies except primary intracranial tumor, non-melanotic skin cancer, and CA carcinoma cervix in situ. Relative contraindications are chest trauma, prolonged cardiac arrest, and those who have received intracardiac injections. Care of patient before harvest. Frequent turning to avoid decubitus ulcers, skin care and dressing changes, urinary and intravascular catheter care, and nasogastric tube for gastric decompression and prevention of aspiration, arterial line in upper limbs as femoral line may be inaccurate during surgery. Anesthetic goals, general, preservation of tissue perfusion, tissue oxygenation and organ viability. Hemodynamics, maintain eulemia and central venous pressure between 6 to 12 millimeter of mercury, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of less than 12 millimeter of mercury, minimize use of vasopressors which may associate with renal graft failure, urine output should be greater than 100 ml per hour, maintain INR less than 1.5 using rust frozen plasma and serum sodium should be less than 155 millimole per liter which associate, which associate with increased risk of liver graft failure. Monitors, blood pressure monitoring, ECG monitoring, core temperature, urine output, central venous pressure, pulse oximetry and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and pulmonary venous oximetry for unstable donors. Hemodynamic support, factors affecting hemodynamics. Hypovolemia secondary to ICP therapy, diabetes insipidus, hyperglycemia induced osmotic diuresis and vasodilatation secondary to brain death. Principles. Bradycardia not treated unless symptomatic as it is seen due to Cushing's reflex. Regardless of hypotension and hypertension, patient is usually hypovolemic. Maintain adequate filling pressure of central venous pressure is 6 to 12 millimeter of mercury and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of less than 12 millimeter of mercury. And drug therapy with vasoactive agents such as dopamine, dobutamine, norepinephrine, phenylephrine and vasopressin. And chronotropic agents like isoprotinol and epinephrine should be used, can be used. Hypotensive agents such as sodium nitroprusate, nitroglycerin and esmolol. Avoid calcium channel blockers and long-acting beta blockers due to negative inotropic action. Ventilatory support. Factors affecting ventilation, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, aspiration, atelectasis, volume trauma and barotrauma, principles of ventilatory support, pressure control or volume control mode depending on airway pressure and tidal volume of 8 to 12 ml per kg if there is no lung injury. If lung injury is there, then tidal volume should be 6 to 8 ml per kg. PaO2 of 70 to 100 mm of mercury and saturation should be greater than 95. FiO2 less than 60 percentage and PEEP should be less than 5 cm of water. Metabolic support. Most commonly, metabolic alkalosis due to mechanical hyperventilation, which is used to treat intracranial, raised intracranial pressure. Others are hyperhypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, hypernatremia. Endocrine support. For diabetes insipidus, it is a most common endocrine disorder. Suspect if polyuria with hypernatremia with hyperosmolarity with dilute urine. 5 percentage dextrose used to treat free water deficit. Once urine output greater than 4 ml per kg per hour, desmopressin should be used with dose of 1 to 4 mix IV QID. Hormonal cocktail for endocrine support. Methylprednisolone 15 mg per kg, 24th hourly. And free triiodothyronine 4 mix IV followed by 3 mix per hour. 
डेस्मोक्रेसी इन पॉइंट फाइव टू फोर यूनिट्स पर हार्ट टू मेंटेन सिस्टेमिक वेस्कुलर रेसिस्टेंस एंड इंसुलिन इन्फ्यूजन टू मेंटेन ब्लड शुगर लेवल ऑफ वन ट्वेंटी टू वन एटी मिलीग्राम पर डिस्ट रीनल सपोर्ट मेंटेन एडिक्यूएट सिस्टेमिक परफ्यूजन प्रेशर एंड ब्रिस्क यूरिन आउटपुट ऑफ ग्रेटर देन वन टू टू एम एल पर के जी पर आर डिक्रीज डिक्रीज यूज ऑफ वैसो प्रेसर्स एंड वॉल्यूम लोडिंग टू इनक्रीज यूरिन आउटपुट अवॉइड नेफ्रोटॉक्सिक एजेंट सच एस अमीनो ग्लाइकोसाइड्स एंड एन एस एडीज टेम्परेचर रेगुलेशन patient become poikilothermic after brain death and aggravating factors are systemic vasodilatation and administration of cold iv fluids and blood products humidified and heated ventilator gases warm iv fluids and warming blankets coagulation abnormalities causes are disseminated intravascular coagulation and coagulopathy dilutional coagulopathy due to fluid resuscitation and release of thromboplastin from injured brain massive blood transfusion and hypothermia and other drugs which we used here are prostaglandin e1 to improve circulation of lung preservation solution glucocorticoids broad spectrum antibiotics manitol and systemic heparinization just before exsanguination and excision so that's right yes okay uh, well dealt with the apnea test for uh, elaborately which i think is Uh, not required in this condition. Once uh, you decide about harvesting the organs, only when a confirmation of brain death is already done and declared by after the two people have examined the uh, patient and then they have uh, declared him as brain dead. And if the relatives and uh, uh, close people are willing to donate the organs, then the patient is going to be undertaken. The question says retrieval of organs from a brain dead or uh, uh at beating donor so we should concentrate more on what are the intraoperative management of these patients which you have system wise beautifully displayed all these things uh one more point we can add is uh, how is the incision made have you ever given anesthesia for a donor like this no. brain dead donor no no oh. so you know they this people are will be very critically ill and will be in the icu already isn't it then only you they examine and find out that they are brain dead and they are not going to get back their consciousness or their spontaneous respiratory effort these are considered as the two criteria to declare a patient as uh, having a brain death so you do all the uh, cranial or examinations to confirm that and apnea test is part of the confirmatory test so you don't have to go into details of all that so the patients mostly coming to the ot are patients who have already been on ventilatory support and other uh, hemodynamic support in the icu for quite some time so the transportation comes as the first and foremost uh, challenge for you so you have to make sure that they don't collapse or crash when you are transferring this patient to the ot so there should be good communication between the icu team and the ot team uh, once the uh, relatives uh, give the, the green signal to donate the organs <clears throat> there should be proper communication and briefing should occur how to ship the patient how what are all the supports to be brought how are you going to safely you transport the patient from the icu to the ot forms the first part of the organ retrieval program then whatever intraoperative challenges are there from maintaining hemodynamic stability organ perfusion and getting a good uh, uh, graft is the most uh, important goal in retrieval of this so uh, during the surgery suddenly there should not be a crash before you open up and then uh, you should not be reviving that patient on the table like that so you must assess the patient how many cardiac arrest he had how many times he was revived revived in the icu all the history you should go through and find out whether the patient is a is a suitable donor or not and whether the cross matching of tissues has already been done and any recipient is readily waiting that also you should know or whether the harvested organs have to be preserved and then transported to some other institution all these uh, modalities should be first uh, planned very well in advance before you <coughs> decide to open up the donor and uh, retrieve the organs okay so that should be given more importance rather than uh, writing more about the apnea test in such length 
the second thing is uh, inside the ot also it should be a team which is uh, well uh, versed in doing this sort of because now, uh, this is not a routine surgery everybody does so most of the time you will find there will be a transplant team coming from elsewhere when you declare a patient as brain dead donor not all institutions will have the same uh, surgical uh, skills and surgeons will be available so the entire team may be coming from elsewhere at the local anesthetist who has been dealing with the patient or the in house anesthetist may be the uh, anesthetist dealing with this patient so there should be good again good communication between the surgeon team which is coming to operate and the uh, anesthetist who are going to manage the patient and the floor nurse and theater nurse they uh, they are in fact in western countries there are specific uh, donor nurses available who are uh, well trained in this sort of organ retrieval program and they only come to assist the surgeons so that is the first point here to elaborate then intraoperatively uh, you mentioned all about the various organs which uh, to be taken care of and the incision is made from sternotomy to down up to the pubic symphysis of the laparotomy it is almost like a autopsy which you have been seeing in the forensic department so they open up the chest completely from the manubrium sternae down up to the pubic symphysis put retractors chest retractors everything and then the serious uh, the uh, order in which the organs are harvested first the heart and then if the lung is also going to be taken lung will be harvested then will be the liver then will be the uh, intestine small bowel and then last will be the kidney and uh, after all that will be the skin and cornea this is the order in which the organs are harvested uh, during the donor program okay so this is the and the in situ perfusion also have to be done to maintain the viability of the heart so the complications of that will be hypothermia and uh, electrolyte imbalance so that also have to be added to that and then you have to <clears throat> anesthesia uh, has to be given uh, not for because the patient is already brain dead so we don't give anesthesia for uh, uh, appending his consciousness but spinal reflexes are more common so there may be motor movement or autonomic hyperreflexia may be there so that has to be taken care of for that you have to use opioid neuromuscular blocking agents and volatile anesthetic agents and volatile anesthetic agents may give the additional benefit of myocardial ischemic preconditioning or protection okay so this uh, what are the anesthetic drugs you are going to use how you are going to manage the spinal reflexia that also has to be added to the management uh, scheme that you said and as i said for positioning if you make a tabular column or a, a flow chart of what are all the things to be taken care of during the management of this donor then it will be a better presentation than uh, writing individual paragraph about that i will show you a flow chart or a diagram like that in my presentation later but you have brought out most of the points in a very nice way So this, this approach, uh, this approach, as uh, I is called um, ventilation, infusion, pumping, pharmacological support, and specific interventions. It's called DIPPS approach. That's what is uh, mentioned in some of the books now. It's the okay. same. What we are doing, that's what we are doing. We are giving ventilation, we are giving infusions, we are definitely pumping, and we are doing everything. But it is called by this name. It's called DIPPS. Uh, VIP. Actually, it was initially VIP, and then now it's called VIPPS. And something which you missed is um, uh, levothyroxine. I think thyroxine is also given uh, intraoperatively. Oh, yeah, I think he said three, the three hydroxyrene. I think he mentioned that. Uh, did he say? Yeah. Okay, and maybe I missed it then. Yeah, he, he missed it. it. That's something. Yeah, and then heparin. Use of heparin. Sometimes uh, heparin. I think heparin. Yeah. I think heparin is so. given. Mm. And of course, temperature uh, warming and like sir. Yeah, yeah. Temperature hypothermia he mentioned and yeah. how to maintain that because he said the patient will become hypothermic. That may help. Yeah. And like all the system wise uh, yeah. descriptions you did a very good job, uh, Mato. Yeah, very uh, nice. Sir. Ah, very nice. Uh, uh, all of you need a little bit of guidance to modify and uh, make a uh, 
impressive presentation of your answers you are writing all the points very well you are preparing very nicely all the points but it requires a little bit of touch up make up only konja abbe araga hero in mari kondu vandha nalla that's all what you have to do and there's a thing called organ preserving cardio pulmonary resuscitation it which has come now just like peri mortem cesarean section like that there's something called organ preserving cardio pulmonary resuscitation like in the sense the idea to do a cpr is not to revive the patient it is it is a lot of maintain the perfusion of everything in this yeah. and that was uh, more uh, i think after it is just the, coming up yeah so, uh, non heart beating donors so previously we were taking only heart beating donors now we you know donation after cardiac arrest is also one of the things which is now accepted and you have to do the retrieval within 30 minutes time so that's the more challenging job there uh, if the patient has already given a consent yes yes exactly has, yeah. uh, suffers a cardiac arrest in the hospital and he says dnr do not revive orders are there then you can take that donor immediately and uh, retrieve the organs so there uh, you know uh, you can't take the heart and lung there but you can take the kidneys because the se- sequential order in which the organs are retrieved are dependent on the warm ischemia time they can uh, sustain so that uh, that is why heart is uh, taken first lung second then uh, liver third small bowel fourth kidney fifth and uh, pancreas all these things are the last so like that they take it okay, based on this factor only so if you are going to take the organs mostly they take the kidney and the pancreas and in some cases small bowel they don't take the heart and lung in a patient who has had a complete cardiac arrest and uh, is willing yes, to donate sir can i add some points sir please sir the extended criteria donors uh, can be highlighted sir because the organ shortage uh, issue has been addressed with extended uh, criteria donors for uh, even for recipients also they have relaxed the criteria and the long term results are good but only thing is intraoperatively the stress is on the anesthesiologist because for lung and heart as you said only 30 minutes will be the margin they are very time sensitive and uh, for uh, lung there are red sign red flag signs like if there is any pre existing infection then the failure rate will be very high similarly for hypernatremia the liver uh, rejection will be very high and patient if you want to retrieve the kidneys then vasoconstrictor therapy should be very much restricted and hypotension should be very much avoided these points already mentioned by dr muthumani you can put it in uh, highlighter or red, red signal so that it captures the uh, uh, examiner's eyes promptly thank you sir thank you dr muthumani thank you madam Uh, Thank you, can sir. We move, uh, Thank you, can sir. we move on to the next uh, presenter? Go ahead. Uh, who, who wants to present next? Dr. Ammu, Dr. Venkat. Sir, I will present. Sir. Okay, yeah, Dr. Venkatesh Rao. Go to Dr. Venkatesh Rao, please. Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Ah, good evening. Today, my class is. Today, my class is erector spine plane block. Not clear. Not clear. and today my topic is erector spine plane block very good okay yeah now you are uh, audible well go ahead okay the erector spine plane block is an interfacial plane block volume dependent a novel regional technique that can be used to provide analgesia of variety of surgical procedures and also to manage acute and chronic pain the first report of successful esp erector spine plane block was done in 2016 for providing analgesia for thoracic pain in patients with metastatic disease for ribs and rib fracture it is done by ferrero et al as this is a relative novel procedure esp block is still in numerous trials with many different types of surgical procedures and various prospective studies are ongoing coming to clinical anatomy and physiology erector spinae muscle is not just one muscle but a group of muscles and tendons which runs dorsally more or less the length of the spine on the left and the right from the sacrum to base of the skull they also known as sacrospinalis groups of muscles these large muscular 
tendinous mass varies in size and shape at different parts of vertebral column. In the sacral region, it is narrow, pointed, and its origin chiefly tendinous in structure. In lumbar, it is large, forms a thick, fleshy mass further up divided into three columns, starting from lateral, intermediate, and medial. Lateral is iliocostalis, intermediate is longismus, and medially placed spinalis muscle. It is attached to the medial crest of sacrum and to the spinous process of lumbar, T12, T11, and thoracic vertebra, and also supraspinous ligament. Once the block is placed, most in most preferably ultrasounded guider, there is an hypothesis that multidermatomal sensory block due to cranial and caudal spread of local anesthetic, blocking the dorsal ventral ramae of thoracic abdominal spinal nerves, achieving blockade of anterior, posterior, lateral thoracic and abdominal walls. This spread is aided by thoracolumbar fascia, which extends across the posterior thoracic wall and abdomen. Chin et al. documented the spread of local anesthetic three or four levels cranially and cordially from the site of injections. The reported mechanism of action is the diffusion of LA, local anesthetic, through connective tissue towards the spinal nerve root. A more recent study described the transforaminal and epidural spread of local anesthetic during ESP using MRI guidance. The advantage of ESP to other thoracic interfacial plane block is because of this spread and resulting abdominal visceral analgesia. Coming to the indications and contraindications. ESP can be used to deliver analgesia for a wide variety of surgical pro procedures involving the anterior, posterior, lateral thoracic and abdominal areas, as well as in acute and chronic pain syndromes. The absolute contraindication is infection at the site of injection and the patient refusal. Coming to the relative contraindication, patient on anticoagulant. But the most recent ASRA, uh, American Society of Regional Anesthesia guidelines, does not specifically address any paraspinal block and anticoagulants. Coming to the technique preparation, an informed consent to be taken. Standard patient monitoring should be in place, which includes pulse oximetry, NIPP, ECG, IV axis, resuscitation, airway equipment should be nearby. Block should be done under strict aseptic conditions, preparing the site with chlorhexidine solutions, sterile conditions to be maintained throughout the procedures. Sterile gloves, sterile cap, and ultrasound probe placed into a sterile ultrasound probe covering for imaging. Coming to the procedure, ESP most often preferred between T5, T7 paraspinal levels, but it can also be performed at lower level as well. Depending on the build of the individual, you can select a linear probe or curvilinear probe. If curvilinear probe is used or any probe, it should be placed in cephalocaudal direction starting over the midline. It should be placed in the midline at the desired level to identify the spinous process. Then the probe is moved slowly laterally until the transverse process is visible. Usually it comes at 2 centimeters. The transverse process should be differentiated from the rib at this level. At this level, the transverse process will be superficial, wider, with flat, squared, hyperechoic line with an acoustic shadow behind, while the ribs are deep and thinner. And below the ribs, we can see the plural marking. So better avoid at this level. Upon verification of transverse process, the three groups of muscles can be identified starting from superficial to deep, which are trapezius, rhomboidus, and erector spinae if you are planning block above T5. If you are planning block below T5, then trapezius and erector spinae will be visible from superficial to deep. Once identified the transverse process, needles should be placed using an in-plane approach in a cephalocaudal direction the bevel of the needle should point posteriorly, inferiorly under USG guidance through the trapezius, rhomboidus major, and erector spinae muscle towards the transverse process. Once the needle tip is below erector spinae, 
a small amount of local anesthetic should be injected so that the erector spinae muscle should be visualized separating from the transverse process this separation from the transverse process confirms the proper needle placement a la should be injected in increments of 5 ml with aspiration after every 5 5 ml to prevent inadvertent intravascular injections the volume of around 20 to 30 ml of 0.25% dubiocaine or 0.5% dubiocaine depending on the toxic dosage to which an opioid or dexamethasone can be added to prolong analgesia if you are planning for a catheter then a small then 10 to 15 ml of la is injected to see the spread of local anesthetics once a yeah, 10 ml is injected then it is easy to spread the catheter into the space then it is once the catheter is in situ then remaining amount can also be injected the catheter should be placed around 5 to 7 cm within the space to avoid inadvertent dislodgement of the catheter if the transducer is placed too medially then thoracic lamina will be visualized as flat hyperechoic lines so to fix the problem move probe laterally if the transducer is placed too laterally ribs will be visualized as rounded acoustic shadow with an intermittent intermediate hyperechoic pleural line so to fix the problem slowly slide the probe medially once the pr- procedure is completed observe the patient for any signs of toxicity at least for half an hour and accompany the patient to pacu and inform the trained staff in the pacu for any signs of local anesthetic toxicity coming to the complications most common if properly placed and oriented complications are rare but most oftenly a failed block can be seen especially in obese individuals but injury to the pleura leading to pneumothorax or injury to the blood vessels spinal cord can also occur infection at the site of injury uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity can also can occur coming to the clinical significance esp is a new newer regional technique that can provide thoracic abdominal and even some lower extremity analgesia it can provide analgesia for myriad of conditions from chronic shoulder pain to pain following hip surgeries because of few published data more investigations are needed to verify the safety complication rates and efficacy of this technique but thank you sir. excellent excellent for a presentation i think practically uh, covered uh, all the points uh, which i thought uh, i also have that in my presentation uh, very nice so are, is there any surgical yeah. indication do you use it as a part of uh, multimodal analgesia during any surgery or can any surgeries be done uh, as a stand alone technique with this technique alone Uh, breast implant breast surgery yes thoracic wall surgeries are have been run by this and uh, bilateral uh, block is it advisable the bilateral will shoot on the local anesthetic toxicity those uh, yeah, volume that but if you restrict the volume to 0.25% uh, levo before again i think sir. you can give bilateral block for spine surgeries to provide good post operative analgesia for uh, spine surgeries also. also also for intra abdominal surgeries take care intra abdominal for analgesia post op analgesia excellent a complication yes. called harlequin syndrome have you heard of sir? that sir it's a complication called harlequin h a r l e q i n harlequin syndrome where no. if you use a one side block erector spinae block it blocks mostly the sympathetic because thoracic lumbar outflow is a sympathetic outflow so it almost blocks it at the emergence of the spinal nerve so it blocks both the anterior and for dorsal ramae uh, so there is a sympathetic block also occurring so the other side the uh, sympathetic system becomes overactive and uh, the patient gets the feeling of flushing and uh, heat on the uh, non blocked side that is called uh, harlequin syndrome so very sensitive patients can complain about that also so you have uh, done a very good job in a good presentation 
Anything else we added or something? Excellent, sir. Really Excellent not. presentation. Really Excellent. fantastic. Yeah. What about uh, Kamachi? Do you have anything to add? Okay. Rao, you have any other uh, topic for you? The total intravenous anesthesia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, proceed. Tiva. Yeah, Tiva, you can go ahead. Total intravenous anesthesia is a technique of general anesthesia which uses a combination of agents given exclusively by the intravenous route without the use of inhalational agents, including nitrous oxide. Some studies they say you can use nitrous oxide, but some say they avoid nitrous oxide. Ideal intravenous agent to be used in Tiva, it should be rapid onset of action, water soluble, rapid offset of action. Non cumulative, non active or non toxic metabolite, it has to be produced. Known pain on IV injection, non irritant when given subcutaneously. Coming to the indications surgery related indications. It is used for requirement of evocal potential monitoring during scoliosis surgery and neurosurgical procedures such as hypotensive anesthesia, especially during endoscopic surgeries. And middle ear surgeries, patient procedures with high risk of postoperative nausea, vomiting, such as strabismus surgery or orchidopexy. And thyroid surgery for recurrent laryngeal nerve monitoring requiring EMG, electromyography. Coming to the patient related indications, patient with history of malignant hyperthermia or postoperative nausea, vomiting, or the Patient with the history of or risk of emergent delirium, especially in children, it is indicated. And in the third indication, if in patients with fear of any face mask, and and also in history of acute or chronic reactive airways. Coming to the procedural indications, remote site anesthesia such as MRI, radiological procedures, it is indicated. Coming to the advantages of Tiva, a fast cleaner recovery for short cases, less contamination from green go greenhouse gases than inhalational agents, reduced airway reactivity, risk risk of laryngospasm and bronchospasm. It preserves hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstrictions and there is less risk of post-operative nausea, vomiting and bowel distinctions and it reduces overall cost does not require any vaporizers. Disadvantage of TIVA. Risk of awareness with TIVA when compared to inhalational agents and pain on injection, especially with propofol and requiring a IV axis infusion pumps, IV sets. Combination of drugs may be re required, particularly when opioids are used, which can cause side effects like pruritis, muscle rigidity. One should be very careful to prevent accidental or unidentified disconnection of IV lines, pumps, or extravasation of infusions. And there will be decrease in plasma concentration or transition from loading dose to maintenance dose. Coming to monitoring during TIVA, ASA minimum monitor standards such as pulse oximetry, ECG, NIBP, capno cafe is required. And to monitor the depth of anesthesia, bispectral index entropy, if available auditory potentials or PEEG, processed EEG monitoring can also be used when neuromuscular blockades are used to assess the awareness which monitors the effect of anesthetic drugs on cerebral cortex. Coming to the drugs and the doses, most common agent which is used is propofol. Other drugs which are used acts as a synergistic agents to propofol, such as benzodiazepines, metazolam, ketamine, alpha-2 agonists such as dexmetodomidine, opioids like fentanyl, remifentanyl. Newer agents are also in market for use in TIVA, such as phospropofol, etomidate, metazolam-related compounds like PF0713, ASID-3043, remimazolam, ZM1232.
coming to the propofol propofol which is most commonly used in tiva the dosage start with 1.5 to 2 mg per kg induction dose followed by 100 to 150 mic per kg per minute for first 10 minutes followed by 90 to 140 mic per kg per minute from 10 minutes to 2 hours followed by 75 to 125 mic per kg per minute beyond 2 hours turn off propofol 5 to 10 minutes prior to the desired time of emergence second most common com, uh, combination which is used is fentanyl starting with 2 mic per kg bolus followed by 0.2 mic per kg per minute infusions the advantage of addition of opioids or any other drugs like dexmedidomidine will have a synergistic effect of propofol so that its dose can be reduced to half so suggested plasma concentration for propofol infusion during induction maintain the dose around 4 to 5 mic per ml slow induction is required in elderly patient which are which old and fragile it requires around 1 to 3 mic per m ml plasma concentration if a young athletic patient is placed then a dose around 6 to 8 mic per ml can be used coming to the maintenance dose of plasma concentration of propofol is 3 to 6 mic per ml so if you are using opioids then you can reduce to 2.5 to 4 mic per ml so concentration on awakening should be 1 to 2 mic per ml coming to the preparation and conduct of tiva so it can be administered by manual dosing infusion pumps ml per hour or target controlled infusion tca pumps so uh, manual infusion pumps if you are planning then there will be risk of under or over dosing especially if propofol is not given a bolus dose starting with the infusion concentration rises slowly and only reaches steady state concentration after several hours so most commonly it is delivered to tca pumps if it is available this tca pumps are contain a microprocessor program with pharmacokinetic model for relevant drug the user selects the drug and pharmacokinetic model to be used by that tca pump and inputs the patient characteristics such as age body weight target plasma brain concentration that is effect site concentration with the pump differing the uh, determining the initial bolus and subsequent infusion rates the most commonly used tca pumps are marsh uh, which takes the body weight at plasma concentration snyders that is effect site brain which takes the weight height age and sex and also it calculates the low lean body weight in pediatric modules models katari and pediffuser can be used so before uh, before starting a tiva should be able to achieve a appropriate and steady state concentration in plasma and effect effective site pump should be charged before use and syringes should be properly labeled with the drug name and concentration loading of the drug especially propofol should be done under aseptic precautions to prevent bacterial contaminations infusion sets should have leaker lock systems to prevent accidental disconnections should have anti siphon valves to prevent uncontrolled infusion from damaged syringes it should contain anti reflex valves preventing backward flow of drug when more than one drug is administered through the one iv cannula or center venous catheter reduce the dead space as low as possible between the patient and the pump and the infusion pump should be visible visible throughout the anesthesia anesthesia provider should regulate the check check pump regularly if during the maintenance of anesthesia a tca, TCA pump shuts down due to depleted power it is not possible not appropriate to restart tca anesthesia using the previous target concentration if this was done the pump calculation would not take into account the drug previously administered and it give another induction dose resulting in a excessively high drug dose if if the pump is shut down accidentally then it is appropriate to restart in manual mode and program a infusion rate similar to that being delivered at the time of failure coming to the ending of a tiva case 
towards the end of the case at the surgical stimulus is reduced the target concentration can be gradually reduced although the effect side concentration should not be dropped below 2 mic per ml countdown time on pump will be given an estimated time left for the concentration to drop 1 mic per ml finally all infusion lines should be flushed thoroughly before handing over to the concerned staff thank you very good i think uh, your classification of indications or usage of tiva based on the surgical procedure patient characteristic and location of uh, the procedure uh, i think you have missed out on uh, tubeless airway surgeries did you mention that no sir no sir i don't oh, know i think that is one of the main indication apart from the uh, your potential monitoring during spine surgery Okay, uh, nowadays they do tracheal procedures and uh, laser procedures uh, the airway which are done mainly under tiva that's one of the important indications for that and uh, always you have brought out all the points and uh, whenever you talk about tiva you have to uh, talk something about the pharmacokinetics of tiva also where uh, what is the uh, single compartment model two compartment model three compartment model and how the plasma concentration the initial loading phase and then maintenance phase becomes important and I, I, uh, as you actually a road sir but it's uh, too long i have not lengthy. mentioned it uh, <laughs> no you can just compart- at least m- mention yes, the uh, yeah. basic uh, principles in one line yes, i don't want you to or you can just draw uh, diagrams of uh, the two compartment and three compartment and how the a cap constant uh, how the when it's drug traverse huh? when a drug is given iv it doesn't stay in the circulation for a long time it gets distributed throughout the body to tissues muscles organs fat as well and being eliminated through kidney liver etc so how that, long how they come back and then once you stop the infusion how they regress back to the plasma and then only get eliminated eliminated then only you can explain the contact sensitivity half time Okay. It can be explained only if this pharmacokinetics is uh, mentioned. So uh, I think that uh, becomes important uh, more than uh, time factor. You can just draw the diagram and then simply say this is how the section of the half time is uh, becomes important. Because unless you know when to stop the infusion for a proper recovery, especially when prolonged surgery, propofol you know has got different contact sensitivity half time. If you use it for 30 minutes, there is one time. If you use it for three hours, there is another time. If you use it for six hours, especially in the ICU, also people use tiva for sedation during ventilation. It is not only for surgeries. Even nowadays, on mechanical ventilation, patients also receive tiva in the ICU setup. So, if you plan to uh, stop the ventilation and uh, regain the spontaneous ventilation. you should know the contact sensitivity time especially when you will be infusing it for 12 hours to 24 hours and uh, that time unless you give adequate time for uh, removal of this uh, mid stoppage of the drug the patient waking up time will be from it more for long so you have to uh, mention that three also comp- here three compartment model yeah very good nice so then anything to add to this So no, sir. I think he covered most of it, sir. Very relevant. Yes. Thing, like and uh-huh. what uh, you have and covered. Very lucid yes. presentation also. Yes, he very nice. He yeah. made uh, subheadings and then uh, under each heading he is uh, very clearly saying whatever he wants to. Say. Congratulations, sir. Oh, very good. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Madam, and uh, uh-huh. thank you, Dr. Rao. We can move on to the next uh, presenter, sir, Dr. Rao. Yeah. Vote, Dr. Amu. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, clear. Please proceed. My my topics for today are opioid free anesthesia and um, physiology of hemostasis. I'll be first presenting the opioid free anesthesia. Coming to the introduction. Before the advent of opioids, the goal of general anesthesia, hypnosis, immobility. and analgesia was maintained with high doses of hypnotics or inhalational agent 
which caused severe hemodynamic instability. Once opioid come into play, a concept of balanced anesthesia came, which offered better hemodynamic stability. However, opioid based anesthesia has well recognized side effects based on its receptor targets as well as the complex effect on, on the immune system. Recently, due to opioid epidemic, which started from 2012, which means due to increase in death related to the prescription of opioid, you surpass the deaths from su suicides and motorcycle accidents. So recently, a move has been there for non-opioid based anesthesia to avoid this adverse effects like uh, sedation, dysphoria, delirium, constipation, PONV, urinary retention, opioid addiction, and tolerance. Opioid free anesthesia is a practice that completely excludes the use of intraoperative systemic neuraxial or intracavitatory opioids. When can it be used? When the opioid free anesthesia can be used? In patients with obstructive sleep apnea, which will prevent the respiratory depression and airway obstruction. In early recovery after surgery, surgery protocol patients, patients suffering from chronic post surgical pain complex regional pain syndrome patients coming for surgery, cancer-related pain coming for surgery, and cancer surgery, uh, cancer surgery which uh, the no, uh, opioid-free anesthesia will prevent the early recurrence. How the opioid-free anesthesia is done? A multimodal anti-nociceptive approach is utilized to achieve the opioid-free anesthesia. The agents that can be used include pharmacological and regional anesthetic technique. Pharmacological agents. First is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which acts by the mechanism of <coughs> inhibiting the cyclooxygenase, which in turn will reduce the prostaglandin synthesis. Also, it acts by the modulation of central response to noxious stimuli by reducing the prostaglandin synthesis in spinal cord. The commonly used drugs are paracetamol, diclofenac. The disadvantages being a GI bleed, platelet dysfunction, renal impairment. The commonly used astaminophen do dose can be used as 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram dosage IV stat or it can be used in repeated doses in Q8 early intervals. Then coming to the non-NMDA receptor antagonist. Ketamine uh, is the most commonly used. Ketamine is known since 1965 for its uh, analgesic, amnestic and psychomimetic effects. Antagonism through non combative inhibition of glutamate binding, resulting in analgesia, amnesia, and psychomimetic effects. Dosage of 0.2 to 0.4 milligram per kilogram can be used to achieve a opioid free anesthesia. Then, coming to magnesium, it acts via N methyl D aspartate receptor, also effects on the calcium influx. Dosage of 30 to 50 milligram per kilogram bolus and 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram infusion can be used. Coming to beta blockers, esmolol 0.3 milligram per kilogram usage, which attenuates the unwanted hemodynamic responses during surgery and as an adjunct to pre-op analgesia. Parenteral local anesthetic, lignocaine, most commonly used, selective depression of brain transmission at the level of spinal cord. Coming to alpha agonist, dexmedetomidin, it's centrally mediated sedative mechanism. The alpha-2 mediated inhibition of the pontine locus ceruleus, which causes the disinhibition of the preoptic nucleus and increase in the release of GABA. Dosage of 0.5 to 1 microgram per kilogram can be used of, uh, and clonidin 0.5 microgram per kilogram IV also will cause the similar effects. Another drug is corticosteroids dexamethasone. 1 microgram per kilogram IV can be given, which will reduce the post-operative nausea and vomiting and post-operative inflammation. Coming to the, uh, and gabapentinoids, pregabalin and gabapentin are most commonly used. Gabapentin has a dose of 900 milligram, 1 to 2 hour prior to surgery per orally will reduce the intraoperative hemodynamic response and post-operative pain. It will act by binding to the alpha-2 delta subunits of uh, voltage-dependent sodium channel in active neurons, which will inhibit the development of hyperalgesia and central sensitization. Coming to the regional anesthetic techniques, local infiltration, peripheral nerves, and plexus blocks. 
continual neuraxial block then con coming to the advantages of opioid free anesthesia use in selective group of patients like osa as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and it will decrease the opioid abuse addiction resistance and tolerance then fast tracking eras protocol etc disadvantages ofa side effects like bradycardia av block acute coronary syndrome hyperglycemia etc chance of intraoperative awareness and perception of pain can be there if not monitored properly Uh, there are many protocols available for opioid free anesthesia one of the example is the opioid free protocol in bariatric surgery ketamine with a dose of 0.25 mg per kg ideal body weight plus magnesium 40 mg per kg ideal body weight lignocaine 1.5 mg per kg ideal body weight with dexmedetomidine in 1 microgram per kg uh, ideal body weight at induction of anesthesia 10 minutes prior continue till 30 minutes prior to extubation dexamethasone and ontansetron were administered for post operative nausea and vomiting and prophylaxis paracetamol at the end of the procedure uh, why this is important under adequate hypnosis that is bispectral index of 40 to 60 and paralysis tachycardia are the usual tachycardia and hypertension are the usual clinical indications of inadequate anti nociception the adequate control of hemodynamic response during anesthesia does not guarantee that the patient will emerge from anesthesia without pain equal importance to address nociceptive pathways as well as the autonomic response this is the rational for using a multimodal approach during a opioid free anesthesia that's all sir good for the next presentation See, formally we were taught, or we have been trained for a long time on what is called OBA, opioid-based anesthesia. Without opioid, we never knew how to give anesthesia. We thought opioids are the only drugs which can relieve the intra and post-operative pain. But uh, based on the side effects or complications of opioid uh, drugs, like uh, nausea, vomiting, respiratory depression, constipation. all these things and the one important thing did you mention about opioid induced hyperalgesia sir i just mentioned opioid induced hyperalgesia yes sir she so, mentioned it sir yeah okay so all these things i mean uh, the potential for addiction also these are the things which made people think that we can avoid this and go to what is called opioid free or uh, earlier it was opioid sparing anesthesia or analgesia what is the difference between oesa that is opioid sparing anesthesia and opioid free anesthesia opioid sparing means reducing the dosage and interval of opioid administration yeah, without completely it. avoiding excellent so some amount is allowed some amount of yeah. opioid is allowed and yeah. not the regular dosage that's what is called opioid sparing yes. okay. so from oba we went to oesa then now we are trying to go for ofa It is OPA totally avoiding all tramadol. Can tramadol be included in the OSA? Yes, tramadol is not. It's also a mild opioid. So people, even though it is not classified under the classified drugs, you don't require a narcotic license to possess or sell tramadol. Whereas you need a narcotic license for fentanyl, methadone, morphine, all these drugs. So tramadol comes as a non-narcotic list, but for OFA purpose, tramadol is not included in that. So you go for all the other drugs and try to, because pain is a complex phenomenon. It is uh, described as what the patient says. If he says he is feeling pain, you have to give respect and accept that. You can't say no, no, no. If you are the pain, you can't have some which pain and all that. We cannot say. so that is the big, biggest difficulty in the management of pain so whatever patient says you have to accept it is an unpleasant sensation of course and uh, so you have to use all these drugs in a judicious way gabapentin is used no sir gabapentin uh, more or less more of for neuropathic pain they use that yeah they, people especially if they have uh, diabetic autonomic neuropathy and pain 
their uh, ideal candidates for uh, including gaba pentin also as uh, yeah. for this post operative pain relief and it is being given as a pre medication as a preventive measure to reduce the pain also but the only disadvantage with gaba pentin is prolonged sedation so people may be sleeping especially the tablet lyrica which is available 75 mg i prescribed it to one old lady thinking that uh, he will get rid of the pain but uh, it came back with a complaint that lady is sleeping for 3 days very drowsy so from that time on i started reducing the dose for elderly people to 25 mg first and then try to increase it slowly it's used as part of your gabapentin so the other thing is uh, she was mentioning about uh, lignocaine and blocks but uh, you can also give intravenous lignocaine for analgesia that is also an yeah, yeah that she mentioned as 1.5 mg and the combination for IV sir okay yeah uh, okay. she mentioned that as you are giving all the four drugs uh, the combination yeah lignocaine steroids magnesium uh, yes. regional block dexamethasone i think is one of the drugs uh, did you mention that uh, mo Yes, yeah. uh, next time it's a micrograms. Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Yes, 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 so these are all the things about uh, ofa uh, but still <clears throat> many people don't agree with that because they say there have been reports or studies which say that uh, whatever complication that has been there with uh, opi drugs like constipation or uh, ileus uh, nausea vomiting all these things are there with some combinations of ofa also and uh, you also mentioned that uh, Uh, and then can be given for nausea vomiting and another important uh, contraindication for ofa is any allergy to any of these drugs so we must make sure that uh, what are all the allergies the patient is having before you plan because you are going to use uh, multiple drugs uh, we must know or we must inquire pre operatively and uh, document which are drugs some people know they may be uh, allergic to nsaids or paracetamol and uh, our aspirin all these drugs may cause allergic reactions so we have to make a proper documentation of uh, any allergy to usage of these drugs because so they are commonly prescribed for other conditions also like body pain allergy and all those things so if somebody has had a very severe reaction with any of the nsaids you have to totally avoid that in your combination of drugs that you use for uh, for your pain right okay good so that's last topic yes sir can we move on to the next topic sir yeah physiology of hemostasis dr amu please physiology of hemostasis introduction hemostasis means halting of blood it's a complex interaction between endothelial cells platelet and coagulation protein that result in a prompt platelet plug and then localize thrombus formation at the site of a break in vascular integrity it can occur in two stages primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis primary hemostasis is the initial response which starts with interaction between the platelet and subendothelial protein and fibrinogen and resulting in a stable platelet plug secondary hemostasis with the conversion of this platelet plug and soluble fibrinogen into stable network it involves four mechanisms first is constriction of the blood vessel Second is the formation of a temporary platelet bl- plug, which include first is the platelet adhesion. Once the endothelial in- injury is occurred, there will be release of subendothelial von Willebrand factor, and with the help of Adam TS thirteen enzyme, it will convert it to soluble, smaller soluble forms. These smaller soluble forms will uh, help the platelet to adhere to it. Uh, with the help of gp 1b 5 and 9 uh, receptors and with the help uh, the ad- other adhesion molecules are fibrinogen and collagen fibrinogen will be ad- adhered to the platelet with the help of gp 2b 3a receptor 
and collagen with the help of GP one A, two A, and six receptors in the platelet, which will lead to a series of kinase activity and signaling, which then lead to the activation of the platelet. The activation of the platelet will lead to the release of thromboxin A two from from which is generated from the arachidonic acid with the help of cyclooxygenase one enzyme. Then and the confirm conformational change of platelet, which will lead to the granule release of ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and serotonin, which will help in the activation and uh, at activation and amplification of the platelet. And which will lead to the activation of GP two B three A receptor. This activation of GP two B receptor two B three A receptor will lead to the aggregation of platelet with the help of von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen. This is the step of adhesion, activation, and aggregation of platelet. Next third step will be activation of the coagulation cascade. And the formation fourth step is formation of fibrin plug or final clot. Coming to the coagulation cascade, there will be two pathways: the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. There are thirteen proteins of coagulation include uh, involved in this. Coming to the extrinsic pathway first, then the tissue factor. Tissue factor is is known as a factor three. Which will binds to the factor seven and convert it to active factor seven A, with proteolysis with forms the proteolysis with prote factors ten and nine with proteolysis the factor nine to nine ten to ten A. Factor ten is Stuart power factor, which is activated. The Stuart power factor will convert the prothrombin to thrombin, and this thrombin will convert the fibrinogen to fibrin. And uh, this fibrin forms the cross-linking with the help of thirteen factor thirteen, and forms the stable plot. This is the extrinsic pathway. Coming to the intrinsic pathway, damaged endothelium will release kininogen and calicrine, causes conduct activation of factor twelve to twelve A. This twelve A will convert factor eleven to eleven A, and subsequent conversion to nine to active nine A, and Ten to ten a, the activated ten a along with calcium forms the prothrombinase complex and lies the prothrombin to thrombin. It follows the common cascade pathway. Up from cascade tissue intrinsic pathway and ex extrinsic pathway from factor ten, it's a common pathway. <coughs> Then last is the clot resolution or tertiary hemostasis. It occurs by the shrinkage of the clot volume. It is due to the contraction of the actin and myosin inside the platelet, causing the clot volume to contract and causes the activation of plasminogen to plasmin, which will lyse the clot and facilitate the blood flow through the uh, damaged endothelium. <coughs> I'm just mentioning what are the factors which is in involved. Factor one is fibrinogen. Factor two is prothrombin. Factor three is tissue thromboplastin. Four is cal calcium. <coughs> Five is labile factor or proaxillarin. Seven is stable factor or proconvertin. Eight is antihemophilic factor. Nine is Christmas factor or plasma throm thromboplastin. Ten is Stuart Stuart power factor, prover factor. Eleven is plasma thromboplastin antecedent. Twelve is Hegeman factor and thirteen is fibrin stabilizing factor. Coming to the applied aspects. Liver, which produces the factor two, seven, nine, and ten, with the help of vitamin K. So, if there is any disease of or hepatic injury, there will be alteration in the coagulation. Coming to the test, which will assess the pathway, prothrombin time assesses the integrity of extrinsic factor and the common cascade. Uh, activated plasma thromboplastin time in in it assesses the uh, integrity of intrinsic and common cascade. Tissue thromboplastin time or TT it, it assess the integrity of formation of fibrin. <coughs> Coming to the primary and secondary hemostasis, the defect in the primary hemostasis will lead to the bleeding manifestation like increased bleeding time or an immediate lack of the bleeding after a injury. 
in coming to the secondary hemostasis which uh, which involves a numerous enzymatic mechanism it result in the bleeding diseases like hemophilia and christmas tree deficit etc then coming to the applied aspect of platelet activation adhesion and aggregation the anti platelet drugs are based on this activation and adhesion coming to the G gp2b 3a receptors that will prevent the blockers will prevent like apixaban epifibatide and tirofiban will block this gp2b and 3a receptor and prevent platelet aggregation the phosphodiesterase inhibitors like dipyridamol silastrozole etc which will prevent the amplification of the platelet activity amplification of the platelet activation then once the platelet is activated there will be release of adp which will bind to the p2y12 receptor of the platelet which will be blocked by reversible p2y12 antagonist like ticagrel or elinagrel etc and irreversibly blocked by the uh, metabol active metabolites of ticlopidin clopidogrel and prasugrel and coming to the last of uh, cyclooxygenase cyclooxygen inhibitors like aspirin it will prevent the formation of thromboxin a2 that's all okay very good but uh, you just gave a, a verbatim translation of hemostasis saying that uh, stopping of blood but what is the actual definition of the word coagulation how do you define coagulation so sometimes they may word the question as physiology of coagulation if that is so the definition of coagulation says it's a series of chain reactions or a series of reactions or chain reactions converting the inactive components of the blood into active components to ultimately result in soluble fibrinogen being converted to insoluble fibrin strands that is the definition of coagulation it is a series or chain of reactions activating the inactive components in the blood to convert the final step in the coagulation is to form the from fibrin from fibrinogen so the fibrinogen is in a soluble form you have to convert it into an insoluble fibrin and uh, that is the end of the coagulation so that definition has to be given first and whatever mechanism you have described so for the sake of others who are listening there is a difference between adhesion of platelet and aggregation of platelet and adhesion occurs the initial phase of uh, injury between the attachment of platelet to the subendothelial area matrix where only one willebrand factor will stimulate the degranulation of the platelets to release all the factors and this will stimulate further attachment of platelets to platelets so aggregation is platelet sticking with another platelet is aggregation but the initial platelet attaching itself to the subendothelial matrix is called adhesion so you should not confuse between these two and whatever uh, you have described is what is called the classical pathway there is also a uh, cell based theory you have not mentioned anything about that at all or you rather send it into four phases that is uh, what is to be called as a cell based theory by described later because of the lacunae or uh, deficiencies in the uh, initial classic pathway of coagulation okay so that also has to be mentioned to make your answer 100% complete okay otherwise you made a good job of that and describing this without any visual uh, aid is very difficult now you can write it in the examination all these series pathways but uh, just to listen that and then understand this is little difficult Uh, but please uh, how many ever times we read it somehow is <laughs> writing yeah. it so yeah invariably but, uh, uh, invariably there is one small tip how to do that is uh, there are three limbs you know extrinsic pathway then the classical yeah, exactly, yeah. extrinsic intrinsic and common pathway 
So there the main uh, hero is uh, factor 10. That has to be get converted to pen A. And then it will see, go to the factor 5 and then uh, convert 2 into fibrin. So that is a easy method. So to it, yeah. so ultimately, you have to. That is why the newer anticoagulants are all pen factor 10A inhibitors. Oral anticoagulants which you give, that habitatron, all these things are all factor 10A inhibitors are mainly used now as an uh, anticoagulant for the use also. Okay. Uh, <laughs> very good. Kamachi, do you have time for presentation or shall we? Yes, sir, we can go on, sir. Close. Yeah, we have plenty of time. Actually, sir. just to make it interesting because interesting. you're not <laughs> what the factors. Um, uh, why is factor six? Uh, what is what is factor six? We are missing out that you know always. Yeah, I wanted to ask that question. You asked luckily. Oh, you got the answer. Okay, sir. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay, sir. Then we'll continue, sir. So the answer for that, uh, Amu, do you know that, Doctor Amu? I think she has left. <laughs> Any idea why the, anybody else who can answer uh, Madam Asante's question? Because factor six, you know, initially they found out and they found that both uh, factor five and factor six are the same. So they removed that six, even though they already formulated the series. So they didn't want to have two factors with the two different numbers. So they removed it. That's what I read in the book. Correct, wasn't it? Yes, it's part of another. It's part of another factor. So that's why I said uh, yeah. we need to have it a separate name. Okay. Uh, visible. Screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, so I'm starting with the uh, question and answer. Uh, positions of surgery. This is what I meant. Uh, for whom uh, I think Dr. Muthumani presented that, isn't it? Yes, and, sir. Uh, this is how you can uh, make a tabular column. Of this column will have the, the positions, supine modified positions, and then cardiovascular, respiratory, sentinel system, benefits, risk, or you can add remarks and then add whatever you want to do that. So you can uh, mention what happens to the uh, stroke volume, cardiac output, heart rate, SVR, MAP, all these things. Under respiratory, you can mention all these things. So this will give an easy view for your, the examiners also and find out that instead of writing in, in paragraph, this will be a better way. And uh, these are all the pressure points which you will be have to take care of even when the patient is in supine position. The olecranon, the sacrum, coccyx, the, the heel, especially this calcaneal. I had one case of uh, Calcaneal pressure sore uh, when a patient underwent a micro surgery for 15 hours. And uh, next day, the tendo Achilles was exposed because of the pressure over that. From that time onwards, we have started taking care of that. So, he required another micro surgery for that. So, this is a reverse dental number which uh, normally makes a difference. Especially for obese people, this position is very important. When we we uh, try to intubate the patient. We always give a 30 to 40 degree head up field so that the uh, descent of the diaphragm will be very much uh, easy. Otherwise, it will be restricted. So, in obese patients and pregnant women, this slight head up field is always better for uh, our purposes of uh, intubation and the pre oxygenation and all these things. But uh, very few surgeries are done in reverse central birth, so mainly this position is required by us. And uh, this is the lateral position, and uh, can uh, injury can happen in uh, eye, even in lateral position more commonly. <coughs> and stretch injuries like uh, trauma to the axillary nerve and brachial uh, plexus, all these things are very common. So this is how the padding should be done. To avoid uh, pressure point uh, injuries, uh, this is the classical lateral position that you do. And you must make sure that the cervical spine and uh, thoracic and lumbar spines are on in straight line. The head should not go down and hang as you what you see in the other picture. So, this is a very important uh, point you have to keep in mind. And uh, this is uh, what is this position called? Any idea? 
ஒன் <laughs> to expose the cervical area okay so this uh, causes problem with the airway and tube pushing has to be taken care of and uh, this is another tablet uh, column continuing for sitting position so this is how the sitting position is adopted and uh, you can see the legs are kept elevated to prevent hypotension so the retractable position of course i i think i made a mistake in not uh, giving the animation for this there are uh, multiple choice questions you have to say true or false so retractable position can it produce compartment syndrome yes it can produce peripheral neuropathy yes it can produce peripheral compression neuropathy deep vein thrombosis yes it can produce deep vein thrombosis hand injury can you get hand injury in the lithotomy that is when they break the table for the lithotomy you know if the patient's hands are long and fingers are pointing it will be crushed between this table uh, metals and that is where the hand injury will happen so they asked uh, the exam if you can get a hand injury in lithotomy position when breaking the table you have to make sure that the patient's fingers are well away from the side of the table now this is another multiple choice questions for true and uh, false venous air embolism is a potential complication of surgery in the sitting position regarding venous air embolism question a is all venous air embolism can be detected clinically by a decrease in the n-tidal carbon dioxide is it true or not Anybody who can answer, is it true or not that you can detect all the, so the answers are also there. Decrease in oxygen saturation will not always be seen and uh, lead to arrhythmias, RVF, cardiac arrest. Surgeon has no role in the management. That's a false one. So, if the small air embolism cannot be detected by ETCO2. it has to be detected only by transesophageal echocardiography and uh, the second one oxygen saturation may not always fall if the patient is receiving high inspired fio2 you may not get hypoxia sir immediately it takes some more time and it should be a large embolism also and arrhythmias and right ventricular failure are common if there is a massive embolism and surgeon has a main role in preventing further aspiration of air into the venous system by pouring saline or flooding the area with saline so the uh, there are two true answers and two false answers a and c are false b and c are true now coming to the third uh, multiple choice questions regarding complications of patient positioning during anesthesia eye injury only occurs when patients are positioned prone is it true or false hello are you all hearing uh, students oh. students can respond either you can type in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and uh, answer the question anybody can unmute and answer is the first uh, question right of true or false eye injury only occurs when patients are positioned in prone you can get eye injury in any position even supine if you are not properly taped the eye false and as children sir false <laughs> supine is the only position not associated with injury from pressure areas false false cerebral ischemia can occur in the sitting position yes true yes true true the frontal bulk position may be associated with the development of airway edema true yes, true true, true. true. answer yeah 
So the first thing is falls. Any position you can get eye injury. Not only in prone, even in supraniliteral any position, you are not properly covered the eyes and we put a moisturizing agent with the dryness itself, cardiac aberration and injury. That is also an injury. So it is not only by the pressure, but any exposure also can cause eye injury. So any position, you have to take care of the patient's eyes and. Even in supine, as I told in the first picture, you can get uh, pressure areas in the occiput, sacrum, and heels, and cerebral ischemia and uh, airway edema are very common in steep trundling position and sitting positions. So that is uh, just uh, this is Professor uh, Trundleberg. He's a German surgeon, and he trained under Lanky Buck, another uh, German surgeon. So he was the. This is how he. Develop his Trendelenburg position. So, some assistant has to hold the leg and then uh, keep the patient almost hanging down. So, because the, this this person cannot do it for a long time, he designed the table, original Trendelenburg position. Then he designed the operating table uh, depicted in uh, this picture in 1895. And uh, what is this position? This is a steep Trendelenburg position. And you can see, as I told earlier, these are all the shoulder supports to prevent the patient from sliding down from the operating table. Okay? You can see these two black uh, rods or uh, supports to prevent the patient sliding. And what is this position? This is the reverse Trendelenburg position. This is what you do for patients who are obese, especially. If you are anticipating difficult airway, this is the position that you should adopt. This position, is it a surgery position? Yes, it's a sitting position. It's a beach chair position. No, no, no. It's, it's recovery the, position. The patient is not in the OT. It is in the recovery ICU position. Ah, it is a Fowler's position. Semi-recumbent and full, uh, say, um, uh, head up and uh, Paulus, this is actually a O W L E S Paulus spelling. And this is Lloyd Davis position. And this is the position with the patient's legs supported. And this is the 90 degree lithotomy position. You can see the ties are vertically up at the hip joint. So this is 90 degree. I'll show you another lithotomy position. This is a 60 degree lithotomy position. Okay. You can see this the angulation of the thigh is a little different. So, what is the difference you see between these two lithotomy positions? Where is the leg supported? For 90 degree, it is supported at the foot and calf. Okay. More at the leg. There is nothing in the knee joint. Whereas for the 60 degrees, it is always supported at the knee joint. Okay, so here the chances of uh, parent, common perineal or lateral popliteal nerve injury is very common, whereas here sciatic nerve injury is more common. Okay, this is acute uh, shifting. I am going to show three pictures, and you must tell me. Most of you would have come across where this position is adopted for which surgery. Shoulder surgery, beach shoulder surgery. Yes, position for shoulder surgery. So this can be a beach chair position. This is a lateral head up elevated position. And this is how the patient looks after he has been draped completely. Okay. Okay. And what is this position? A kidney bridge position. Like Excellent for kidney bridge position. Very good. What is this position? Where the patient's uh, sole of the foot are opposing each other, or it is opposing against the knee. This is called the frog leg position. Okay, mm -hmm. for some surgeries where you want to prevent the lifting of the leg, you can do it in this frog leg position also. And what is this position? This is the prone position with a 
head, head, uh, head supported with the frame, this A and B. And this C and D, can you just look at the picture and see what it is, why I have put this picture? Indubating LMA. It's not LMA. It's in a regular endotracheal cup. But if you see that butterfly kind of a thing there. Yeah, but what is that? Something else is there. A pointing arrow is there. What is that? Strap to be. Ah, this is a guard to tie it up to your neck so that you are... <laughs> If you just put a micropore tape or a, uh, a thick color, uh, what is that? Uh, a sticking tape for the. Dynacrep, sir. Dynacrep. Dynacrep tape. Uh, Dynacrep or. It may get loosened with the saliva drooling out. So you keep it at the appropriate place to, by removing this connector. You have a strap, like a tracheostomy flap you have. So you can tie it and this will keep the tube in position. Okay, this will go into the you can see this mouth portion, the same thing has been marked here also. So patient cannot bite also. This bite it will act as a bite block when he becomes light. So two advantages of this is if you uh, see they have put a tape and then tied it over the, the back of the neck and it is acting as a bite block also. So that is the method of safeguarding the tube position without slipping out or without uh, getting excavated. This is another method of uh, supporting the head, jelly bag. This is called the jelly bag. It will be soft and it will not cause any pressure effect. So this is the head support in jelly bag. And what is this position commonly adopted for? You can see the head pins traction and uh, already there are markings. So what surgery is planned? Cervical posterior surgery. Cervical spine surgery. Very good. Prone position with head traction for cervical uh, spine. spine surgery, posterior approach. Spine surgery can be done anteriorly also. I think all of you would have known that. So this is uh, another sitting position. So, for posterior cranial process surgery, there are two major concerns with this. What are they? Embolis air embolism. Air embolism is one. Then. So, hypotension and the serious instability during raising the patient from supine to sitting position. Then, venous air embolism during surgery. Okay? These are the two major concerns of this position. So that was about position and anesthesia. Coming to organ retrieval, as I said earlier, communication between the anesthetist and the retrieval team is the key to a successful retrieval operation. The medical management of the disease donor that is beginning in the ICU itself and continue through the retrieval process. Aim is to optimize the quality of transplantable organs. So your aim is to keep the organs absolutely in uh, perfect condition so that it can be working well in the recipient. And the donor is dead and whatever anesthetic drug you give or not to anesthetize him but to attenuate the physiological responses. And how does the process of uh, uh, transferring the uh, brain dead patient to the OT start? First, you must donor and recipient matching should have been done and it should be ready. And time of death to organ retrieval is very, very important. So as soon as the patient has been declared brain dead, our organ should be harvested as quickly as possible. And all preoperative assessment should be done. And timing of the retrieval of operation is also very important. And this is what I told you. The newer technology terminology is Death using neurological criteria. Previously, we were calling as brain dead uh, by doing what is called the brain death examination. Now, the terminology they use is death using neurologic criteria because death can also be diagnosed by somatic, circulatory, as well as neurological criteria. Now, this is defined earlier itself as irreversible loss of both capacity to consciousness and ability to breathe. So, absence of consciousness, absence of respiration. These are the two main criteria to describe a patient as brain dead. And uh, the DNC 
states that this is a permanent loss of brain function as defined by acute responsive coma with the loss of capacity for consciousness brain stem reflexes and the ability to breathe independently so the first assessment of brain stem reflex functioning through the examination of the cranial nerves that is what we do in brain death examination second is the apnea test so you can stop with this to make sure that it is a brain dead patient and some times you may require ancillary testings like a four vessel angiography even the clinical tests are not possible or not uh, are equivocal in that situation you do a four vessel angiography like this and then what are the preconditions you have to do before doing the brain stem test because you have to confirm it is only a right so the clear case of brain stem death so diagnostic certainty is very very important about the irreversible structural injury absence of co-founders which may mimic as though it is irreversible apnea or coma have to be completely ruled out so what are all the co-founders supposing patient has taken over dosage of depressant drugs or the body temperature is very low hypothermia and certain reversible circulatory metabolic or endocrine disturbances all this have to be ruled out to be uh, to avoid a wrong diagnosis of brain death and then pre conditions cannot be fully met where all cranial nerves cannot be tested like in uh, facial trauma or cervical injury then you have to do the ancillary test like uh, four vessel angiography and then only confirm and it is always to be done by two doctors who are familiar with the procedure and who are registered and some countries say as two doctors agree that it is a case of brain death first examination is what is called the legal time of death but in some countries after the second testing only they say that is the legal time of death so there is some controversy in that but in the exam you can say Uh, as soon as the first examination by the two doctors is uh, I mean first doctor is done and confirm and se- subsequently when the second doctor also agrees with the first doctor the first doctor's uh, declaration time is considered as a legal time of death and the debriefing is important as i said earlier process of unfamiliar operating theater because the new team when they come to a different hospital they will be totally uh, new to their certain environment so it is important at some stage after donation process to sit down with those involved and talk through the process answer questions facilitate discussion to offer support to those who need it so this is what i said you can management of potential organ donor hemodynamics respiratory metabolic general like that you can put a flow chart maintain new volumia mean arterial pressure all these points uh, i think dr pani described all these things and how to maintain volume cardiac output myocardial dysfunction respiratory you must do lung protective ventilation and uh, avoid lung water or pulmonary edema metabolic serum sodium is very very important blood glucose should be maintained normothermia hormonal replacement and commonly they have diabetes insipidus so any what how when will you say patient is having diabetes insipidus this is the criteria to say urine output sir urine output ah uh, urine output more than 4 ml per yes sir per uh, minute okay if that is the uh, output volume then you say diabetes insipidus and you can always check the specific gravity of the urine it will be very low it will be hopefully water and it is a cranial diabetes insipidus not a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and uh, hyper hypothermia hyperglycemia all these things are metabolic and in general continue active donor management target hemoglobin should be more than 7 that is another important point and patient dignity including the care of the body is paramount because we have to hand over the body after that to the relatives so you do not disfigure it and then hand over it so that dignity should be preserved and any suspected infection you should also uh, treat it immediately
and the retrieval operation again communication there will be spinal reflexes preserved motor and autonomic reflexes will be preserved and reflex art will be there uh, in neurological uh, uh, criteria and this can cause movement of the trunk limbs and necks and you have to block that so uh, neuromuscular blocking agents may be required and volatile anesthetics also can be cast uh, used to control this uh, spinal reflexes and this gives the additional uh, benefit of producing ischemic precondition to the graft the organs removed in the following order heart lungs liver small bowel pancreas and kidneys and lastly uh, skin and cornea also order of removal is related to the cold ischemia tolerance of each organ lymph nodes and sections of spleen are taken to accompany each organ for immunological testing also and this is how the incision is made right from the sternum to the symphysis pubis so both parotomy and laparotomy are done in the same sitting and uh, immediately they may sometimes cannulate the uh, iota and ivc also i mean ivc uh, to uh, perfusate the various organs So coming to the next topic of opioid free anesthesia i think all that was been nicely told the risk of opioid uh, has been respiratory depression post operative ventilation associated pneumonia if they need a ventilator support nausea vomiting gastrointestinal uh, dysfunction like ileus constipation pruritus urinary retention all these things and hyperalgesia because of the heightened sensitivity <coughs> and uh, this is the some this uh, sometimes is asked as a short note question by itself opioid induced hyperalgesia is a state of nociceptive sensitization after exposure to opioids you get more pain and ketamine reduces this uh, oah and may occur even after a single dose so it is not necessary that patient should be receiving chronically but more common in cancer patients after a few days of usage of opioid they develop this problem so you have to switch over to non opioid drug and uh, this is how the management of peripheral sensitization of the nociceptive nerves are done local anesthetic agents steroids are used and uh, nsaids can be used the benefits of ofa are no respiratory depression uh, no addiction and sometimes ketamine you know nowadays is used as a party drug by youngsters or then people who are having other addiction problems and then as need for post op ventilation no nausea vomiting all these uh, drawbacks of opioids are removed and to have a central sensitization where they are centrally the centers are all uh, affected to hyper react for the pain sensation then Propofol, etomidine, and substance P inhibition by clonidine and dexmedetomidine, the glutamate antagonization. All these things are the methods to uh, prevent central sensitization. The so OSA indications where you have narcotic abuse, opioid intolerance. All these things already have been mentioned. And uh, OSA contraindications: allergy to any of the individual drugs that you are going to use. or if there is a disorder of the autonomic system the autonomic neuropathy patients have to be better avoid relative contraindication eva cases coronary stenosis or acute coronary syndrome patients heart block or extreme bradycardia acute bleeding elderly patients asa core patients and all these patients you try to avoid this and the commonly used drugs are these are the ones local anesthetic clonidine meritomidin ketamine gabapentin magnesium hexamethasone and ketamine is the preferred drug because of various reasons especially for mri and uh, as a pre medication in children or procedure sedation and also in acute and chronic pain management and uh, mixing of ketamine and dexmedetomidin has become now a very common favorite uh, drug for all the treatment coming to temperature and anesthesia core temperature monitoring is very important during most surgeries to facilitate detection of 
malignant hyperthermia how to quantify the degree of hyper or hypothermia and uh, more common than my mh is the uh, other reasons for that are homing infectious fever blood in the fourth ventricle mismatch blood transfusion all these things are other causes of hyperthermia but uh, most common is hypothermia what you encounter in your day to day practice is hypo and not hyper so hypothermia produces a lot of uh, unwanted uh, side effects like myocardial depression and surgical wound infection pyoglobopathy and uh, negative nitrogen balance delayed wound healing post and delayed recovery all these things we have discussed already and the major care cause of hypothermia in most patients even general anesthesia is the uh, internal core to peripheral redistribution and body temperature should be however monitored in most patients undergoing general anesthesia exceeding 30 minutes in duration and in all patients who surgery lasts more than 1 hour and skin surface temperatures are considerably lower than core temperature so whatever you measure if you are using a skin probe and you have to add uh, 2 degrees to the core temperature so skin temperature because of the exposure to the environment will be always less to compare to the core temperature and uh, body temperature is very tightly regulated the control system is complex so having a current <coughs> and as early as 1912 physiologists found out that hypothalamus is the dominant thermoregulatory emperor in the mammals and post processing of the thermoregulatory function has an afferent central regulation and afferent responses so this is what is happening this is a picture to show the imbalance between if there is an increase in the heat temperature is going up so the this uh, side of the balance is up so the temperature in the blood is higher then immediately it is sense in the hypothalamus then if you are conscious you are going to remove your clothes and ask for an ac or fan and your vessels dilate and it uh, gives us the heat and you sweat and also try to cool down the surface and try to bring down the temperature whereas if your temperature is going down if you are hypothermic again it is sensed by the hypothalamus vaso constriction happens muscle shivering happens and stimulation of brown fat in children to cause non shivering thermogenesis and you go into a shelter put on warm clothing so behavioral changes also take place so thermoregulation under general anesthesia uh, activated by behavioral cannot be done by we a patient cannot ask for more clothes so we have to cover the patients leaving them relying only on autonomic defense and external thermal management and the anesthetic can be used to impairment as specific form, uh, forms warm response thresholds are elevated slightly whereas cold response thresholds are markedly reduced so consequently the inter threshold that is the threshold between warm and cold response ranges to increases tenfold approximately 2 to 4 degrees centigrade this is what is happening under anesthesia when the especially general anesthesia and shivering after neuroaxial normal regulatory shivering can be there or it may be because of a fever or infection or a direct stimulation of the cold receptors in the neuroaxis by injected local anesthetic that is why they say whenever you give epidural it is better to keep the local anesthetic in a warm dose method instead of uh, using it in exposed to the cold ambient temperature you bring from outside and use a warm local anesthetic so that you can avoid shivering and uh, hyperthermia can happen uh, when you give prolonged epidural analgesia with a catheter in situ and uh, core temperature can also be estimated and the uh, mouth axilla bladder or infrared oral canal tympanic membrane or temporal artery system or ideally in the lower esophagus and transient receptor potential vaniloid trpv and mentol trpm of the receptors which are fundamental temperature sensing elements in both skin and dorsal root ganglia 
So this receptor is very, very important. These are the two types of receptors which sense the and TRP V1 receptors are heat activated, whereas TRP M are activated by cold. So there are two different types of receptors. And the ERPS plane block, I will rush through that because uh, Rao explained it very well. So this is how the <coughs> ultrasound probe is kept and the inline insertion is done from cephala to cordard. So just go through that. And once you go through that, you go through the three layers of muscle, the upper part above the T5, as you said, trapezius, rhomboid, erector spinae. You go and you can hit the transverse process and gently withdraw and start injecting the gap between the transverse process and the erector spinae muscle. So you first initially uh, inject a small volume. It's a really new uh, method. And as he said, first it was used only for chronic pain, not as a supplementation for anesthesia. And uh, this is the <clears throat> explanation of erector spinae. It is a group of muscles, including iliopostalis, longismus, and spinalis muscles. And uh, it runs uh, from cranium to caudal sacrum. So it runs as a longitudinal muscle. And uh, when you administer that, the drug produces analgesia in this part, so front of chest. This clavicular area is produced by the cervical plexus, so you won't cover it here. So part of uh, the axilla, the entire back on the side of injection. So these are all the areas that are covered. And uh, the target is just go through this and uh, tip of the transverse process. And the method of analgesia, it is uh, spreading through all these areas. You can see this again picture to show how the fluid has spread in this area. And uh, ultrasound technique is used. The patient is made to sit, or you can do it in the lying lateral position also. And usually a linear probe is used. And uh, you go plane, go into transverse process. And this is the description to show how the local anesthetic spreads. So this is the transverse process. This is the erector spinae muscle. So when you inject the drug here, you can see the spinal nerve coming out of the intervertebral foramen, and it is dividing into the dorsal and uh, ventral rami, and it is getting blocked here itself, and it is spreading through this uh, plane also. That is why it's called the interfacial plane block also. And the complications, pneumothorax, sometimes lower extremity weakness also can have an systemic toxicity. This is the Harlequin syndrome due to ipsilateral sympathetic block and priapism unopposed to parasympathetic activity can sometimes result in priapism in male patients. Coming to the post anesthesia, Aldrich scoring was used and that is mainly used in the earlier days in 1970 to transfer the patient from PAC to ward. Then modified in 1995 by the same person who described it, K. Aldrich, and uh, these are all the scores that were given 0, 1, 2, and uh, 5 things were taken into consideration. So 5 into 2, you get a maximum of 10 marks. A score of 9 to 10 suggests that the patient is stable for discharge from PACU to ward. So, but later on, another people, 1998, included this for ambulatory criteria and included these three things. Uh, that is vital signs activity, nausea, vomiting, pain, and surgical bleeding, not the weakness as I said earlier, it's surgical bleeding. So no nausea, vomiting, no pain, no surgical bleeding, all get two marks. So there is moderate uh, nausea, vomiting requiring IM medication, one mark, continues to vomit and requires treatment, zero marks. Like that, pain also is given scoring. So based on these added three things, you can uh, share the patient home itself. Coming to TIVA, definition, method of inducing and maintaining DA exclusively by ad IV administration of drugs without stimulations. And uh, anesthesia for non-operative locations, indications, all these things I will not 
Advantages, easy accessibility, superior profile, less operating room pollution, no risk of MH, no, no less post operative nausea vomiting, and uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstrictor reflex is preserved, better hemodynamic risk uh, control, and pharmacokinetics, the compartment models, physiological models, and hybrid models are there, and uh, drugs used commonly. All that has been mentioned. And these are some of the terminologies which are expected to be your answer. Context sensitive half time. The time in which the plasma concentration of the drug reduces by 50% after discontinuing the infusion. That is what is the important thing. It is termed as the, in this context, it's the duration of infusion. Because as I said earlier, propofol. Uh, Switching of time will vary depending upon the duration you have administered. So that is what is called the context sensitive time or drop in concentration 50% after stopping the infusion. And effect site equilibrium is another terminology which is important for maintaining the specific plasma concentration to get a desired clinical response. Okay, that is the lag time. And it is uh, determined by the rate constant. From that. This is where I said the three compartment model picture will help in uh, uh, describing or explaining how you want to do that. And there are manually controlled automatic thruster machines and target control syringe pumps and volumetric pumps. All of you have seen this is a syringe pump and this is a volumetric pump. Uh, use of FIBA. Our, uh, what the constraints are, it's uh, quite costly because you have to buy all these uh, pumps for uh, accurate uh, delivery. And disadvantages are acquisition costs, setup greater workload than vaporizers. Early and late respiratory depression can happen. And uh, sometimes opioid side effects like uh, bilirubin, muscle rigidity, all these things also can happen. And if supposing IV line is disrupted, you will have a problem. And the awareness is another important thing which you have to keep remembering in both when you say Eva. These are all the Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, students, any doubts? Presentation on coagulation, but it's quite lengthy. Uh, if you have the time, I'll just run through it also. Uh, sir, with your permission, can we uh, add on something interesting clinically so that it becomes uh, part of a lengthy discussion, sir? Can we have it for a case, cardiac case discussion or uh, newer anti oral anticoagulants? The applied part of this coagulation and. Uh, no, but uh, for theory, we have to specifically guide them what to write. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Mix something else and they will get confused. Ah, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. Then if we can run through it. Since you have to just be very specific. Very clear cut in what you want to want them to write in the theory paper. Yes, sir. We can go through there this uh, answer, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, yes. sir. We can go through, sir. 